recording here. Welcome everybody uh, to our resource adequacy meeting uh, hosted uh, by Commerce and Utilities and Transportation Commission. Um, today we are have a packed agenda, so we're going to uh, review that real quickly and then uh, get on with our meeting. Um, we'll have some opening remarks um, from Chair Danner and Assistant Director to the Energy Policy Office, Michael Burrs. Um, we will then uh, move to having some presentations from the Western Electricity Coordinating Council and the Northwest Power and Conservation Council that will be followed by a metrics panel that will be looking at metrics for resource adequacy. And then we will break um, and be rejoined, come back together and have a presentation from the Western Power Pool. We'll have an hour lunch break from 12.15 to 1.15. And at that point, um, we will uh, be looking uh, at another panel presentation, this time from the Utilities and the Bonneville Power Administration. And then we will have a meeting at 2 o'clock, or we will come together at 2 o'clock, I'm sorry, to um, discuss uh, some resource adequacy policy options and incentives that we collected um, over the last few weeks through a public survey. And then we will wrap for today's meeting. Um, throughout today's meeting, uh, we would like uh, everyone to uh, hold their uh, questions until after the presentation. At that point, you can uh, put your question in the chat or raise your hand uh, in Zoom. And uh, we will then answer the questions in the order in which they are received. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chair Danner. Thank you, Austin. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to our 2022 annual meeting to discuss resource adequacy, focusing on the coming year. To me, resource adequacy refers to ensuring that there will be sufficient electric uh, generation and grid resources available to serve electric customers. It means ensuring that our region will avoid blackouts, price spikes, power shortages or interruptions in all but the most extreme circumstances. We're going through a period of great change. As we transform our energy grid, moving away from carbon intensive generation sources to more renewable and carbon free, we are also facing population growth, electrification of transportation, changing weather patterns with 114 degree days and sometimes reduced hydropower production. We must be proactive knowing what resources we have, what resources we need, what resources we can share, where resources need to be cited, and who must share their costs. I'm looking forward to an informative conversation today, and thanks to all who are joining us, especially our presenters, and I also want to thank the staff at the UTC and Commerce who have worked hard to put together today's program. I also want to recognize Senator Tim Sheldon for acting on his concerns about resource adequacy, passing legislation that requires us to keep our eyes on the ball and, uh, to develop strategies to ensure that our electric services are safe, reliable, and affordable in this transformative time. So uh, with that, I look forward to a great conversation today. Again, thank you all for joining us. And back to you, Austin. Thank you, Chair Danner. Um, Michael first, would you like to give your introduction? Absolutely. Uh, thanks so much, Austin. Thanks, Chair Danner, and thanks to all of you for being here. My name is Michael Furs. I'm an assistant director of the Department of Commerce, and the team that I lead is our energy division. As we just heard from Chair Danner, uh, resource adequacy is important for, for Washington, it's important for the region uh, and beyond. But as I also heard, it's just one 
critical energy issue that you might be spending your time on today. Um, because of the nature of the conversation, I hope that you're able to set aside what distractions might come so that we can share in your best thinking on this issue. I also want to thank the presenters uh, who are going to share some thoughtful work as they present some pretty complicated issues uh, that we'll need to, uh, to discuss. And thanks again to the staff from Commerce and UTC whose work made this event possible. The hope for today's presentation and discussion is that it will provide everyone who's responsible for or concerned with resource adequacy a better sense of how we're doing and where we need to improve. We want to keep the risk of power supply shortages as low as reasonably possible. We want to acknowledge that there's always risk that the power demand could exceed the available supply. And we couldn't afford a system that eliminates all such risks. So we plan and prepare for those contingencies. We want to ensure that the electrical power meets our increasing need for clean, affordable, and reliable energy. I'm not sure where uh, each of you are out there in the Zoom matrix. I'm usually in Olympia, and I feel very fortunate to have spent yesterday in Seattle. Uh, for any of you that were up there, as an absolutely glorious, warm, sunny day, and as the last one that I remember since February. Our days aren't always like that. And even on what seems like a nice day, uh, I know that folks in the power industry have been working hard to manage a system uh, that has to contend with the increasing volatility of our weather system. And you do so in a way that is seamless when folks reach for a light switch uh, to bring in um, electricity into their home. Last summer, in late June, about this time, our state experienced weather patterns that were literally off the charts from what we expect in Washington. There were some customers who lost power due to that heat, but not because of the power supply shortage, because of a power supply shortage. And that's because utilities anticipated the weather event, they worked to meet the challenge that it presented, and they did so successfully, like they do on so many other days. So when it comes to our time together today, be prepared for a day of complex, highly technical presentations. I've got an extra cup of coffee by me. Any discussion of resource adequacy is gonna be complex because the electric power system itself is, is that way. It's complex at the engineering level with thousands of power plants operating in sync to serve millions of customers across the West. It's also complex in terms of the web of institutions and agencies that have a role in assuring that power supplies are sufficient to meet demands. We know every electricity is responsible for serving its own customers, but your success and our success really only comes to pass when the utilities and power system operators work well together with government regulators and policymakers. So with that, I'll say thank you one last time and turn it back over to you, Austin. Thank you, Michael. We'll now get started with our presentations for today. Uh, uh, Austin, gonna... Austin, before yeah. we do that, I, I wanna recognize, uh, I understand that Senator Shelton is attending our meeting today and I wanted to offer him an opportunity to make comments if he wishes to do so. Senator Shelton, are you there? And do you wish to make a comment? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, I am. Hope that I'm coming through down yes, here in the bunker. Yes, we can see you. We can All see right. you in the bunker today, but I, I also uh, 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 want to echo the the uh, opening comments of uh, you two gentlemen about uh, the importance that we face the uh, the challenges that are here in front of us. So I'm just excited that uh, so many people are attending. That I understand that there's lots of comments and suggestions, which is great. So uh, I'm looking forward to. Uh, a wonderful day of, of learning more about our issues and uh, uh, watching us all work together. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. Uh, and back to you, Austin. Thanks, Chair Tanner, and thanks, Senator Sheldon. Glenn, uh, would you like to start our first presentation for today? I will. I'm uh, eager to, uh, to get started here. Uh, my name is Glenn Blackman and I'm manager of the Energy Policy Office at the Department of Commerce. And um, I'll be moderating the first couple of, uh, of panels or presentations that we have today. The first one is uh, from the, uh, the uh, uh, about the Western Assessment of Resource Adequacy. 
And I, I, I would, um, I thought I would explain kind of the significance of, of that, why we invited them, but it, it'll be so apparent from uh, their presentation uh, that I think it's, we might as well just uh, launch right into their presentation. So I would uh, turn it over now to Victoria Ravenscroft and Connor Klosterman for their presentation. Great, thank you. And can you all hear me all right? Yes, we can. Great. Well, good morning. Uh, as, as has already been stated, resource adequacy is a very important issue in the West, and we are very pleased and honored to have been invited. Uh, my name is Victoria Ravenscroft, and I manage the uh, senior uh, the Policy and External Affairs Department at WEC. I'm joined today by Connor Klosterman, who's our policy analyst. I'm also joined today by Matthew Elkins, who manages our performance analysis and resource adequacy department, and he is here for technical support um, on what we're going to share with you. We're going to talk just a little bit about WEC and, and um, to give you some perspective, and then we are going to dive in, not too deep, not as deep as you'll hear later today, but a little bit deep into the details of our Western assessment of resource adequacy. Uh, really quickly, before, we, before I turn it over to Connor to talk about WEC a little bit, I do want to mention that WEC's role in resource adequacy, as it is with anything else that we do, is focused on reliability. We understand there are a lot of considerations that play into the resource adequacy conversation, but we are focused on, mm -hmm. on reliability. Um, we also see our role as a partner in trying to put together this puzzle that is resource adequacy in the Western interconnection. And so the analyses that we do and the partnerships that we form, um, we understand are part of the bigger picture. And we're going to see a lot of other parts of that picture today. I'm personally very excited. I think you've put together a wonderful agenda. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Connor, and he's going to start us off by talking a little bit about WEC and our role uh, in, in the electric industry. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Again, my name is Connor. I'm a policy analyst at WEC. Um, and I want to start off talking about who WEC is. Um, WEC, or the Western Electricity Coordinating Council, is the regional entity that has delegated authority through the Electric Reliability Organization, or the ERO, to ensure a reliable and secure bulk power system in the geographic area known as the Western Interconnection. And on this map here, the little blue on the left, that is the, the Western Interconnection, that part of North America. Our authority or our responsibility to do this work comes from FERC via the, via the Federal Power Act. FERC delegates authority and responsibility for the bulk power system to NERC, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, but then delegates that responsibility and authority to different regional entities, whom, whom one of which WEC is. We partner with NERC and our sister regions in what we call the Electric Reliability Organization, that ERO. Um, next, let's talk a little bit about what WEC does. So WEC neither owns electric infrastructure such as transmission lines or generation plants, nor has authority or jurisdiction over siting, permitting, cost allocation, construction of any of these projects, right? Rather, we work with our stakeholder community to ensure compliance with reliability standards. We perform analyses, draft reports, and facilitate discussions about issues that impact the reliability and security of the bulk power system in the Western interconnection. Now we are the only independent interconnection wide organization in the West, which helps lend credibility to our findings. Um, one specific work product we have produced in the last six months is our 2021 Western assessment of resource adequacy, which we are here to talk with you all about today. Uh, but first, I want to set the groundwork and make sure we all frame resource adequacy in the same way for the purposes of this conversation. So what is resource adequacy? Uh, the NERC definition of it is the ability of supply side and demand side resources to meet aggregate electric, electrical demand. At its most basic level, resource adequacy can be summed up by this equation here. Does your load equal your resources? Uh, but balancing this equation is a lot more complex. It has changed recently, right? Um, on the next slide, we will talk about how, how the balancing calculus has all changed. But I want everyone to really understand, for the purposes of today, at its most basic level, a system is resource adequate when it is able to generate and transport enough electricity to meet 100% of its demand. That's it, right? It's pretty simple on its face. However, as is the case with most things, it is a lot easier said than done. So today we are gonna to talk about the generation side of things. 
does Washington and the rest of the Pacific Northwest, including BC, have capacity enough to generate electricity to meet its demand over the next 10 years? Uh, but first, again, let's level set on another level and understand how we know when we are resource adequate. So traditionally, to balance this equation, we counted up all the load and all the capacity to make sure that those two sides of the equation are equal with some extra reserves built in to account for unforeseen circumstances. For the most part, it's been a pretty straightforward calculus, right? For the example, take this pie chart here. You know, you have your, your coal, your gas, your nuclear, your hydro, solar and wind now in there too, and make sure that adds up for the capacity to equal more than the demand. So for example, here we have 107 megawatts of capacity, only 100 megawatts of demand, so then we're resource adequate. And this method of counting capacity of resources has worked well historically, because one, we have been so resource rich in the West here and have had huge margins of capacity. And two, our resources were almost all low variability resources, meaning that these resources are dispatchable so we can control how much we generate when and where. Now, over the last several years and into the, into the foreseeable future, Variable energy resources have grown and account for increasing percentages of the portfolio. In fact, that sometimes part of the interconnection are running solely on variable energy resources like solar and wind. But we can't dispatch these resources, so we don't know how much of that capacity to count on in our equation. When the sun is out, solar may be producing close to 100% of its capacity. But when a cloud moves overhead, this number goes way down, right? So in our equation, which may look like this pie chart here, the capacity numbers still add up, right? We're still getting to 107 megawatts of capacity. We're still over 100 me megawatts of demand. So here we look like we, we have enough energy, but that 10 megawatts of solar may not produce or the wind may not be blowing. And in those cases, we may not be resource adequate. So to account for this, there are a couple of ways to address uh, this issue and account for variability of resources in our resource planning work. The first is to alter the value of variable generation in the equation. The variable energy resources are, are discounted based on different mathematical and statistical calculations um, of how much they can, they can be counted on to produce. So that 10 megawatts of solar, it only counts for three megawatts of capacity in our equation. This means to be, that to be resource adequate, we need to add additional resources, right? Because for example, in our pie chart here, we're still only at 92 megawatts of capacity when we, we discount our, our solar and our wind. Now, this is clearly an oversimplified example, but this is generally what we have done to balance that RA equation for years, and it has worked out very well. Uh, but there are also other ways to do this, right? Another way to address this issue is to look at resource adequacy through an energy lens, in addition to capacity lens. And that is what WEC has done in our, our Western assessment of resource adequacy. So I'm gonna turn things over here to Victoria to kind of highlight some of this work and walk us through that process. Great, thank you, Connor. And if you'll go to the next slide. So WEC started our Western Assessment of Resource Adequacy in 2020, and we did it um, based on some input from stakeholders that they wanted to see a West specific report. WEC has been in the resource adequacy space for a long time. Matthew and his team have been working with NERC for years to prepare um, a Western assessment that we fed into a national or continent wide assessment. So we do this now, this, is, this will be our third year doing this. Um, one of the things I wanna point out before I jump into the numbers is that our analysis really should be thought of as, as a risk identification or a risk assessment. Um, if you think of what we're doing as trying to create sort of a heat map where you can see the red spots uh, where maybe there's some additional risk. Our analysis isn't gonna give you the answers to those risks. Um, and that's where we're kind of pointing and saying more analysis, more investigation and more thought needs to go into these areas. So it's important to understand that because we are looking across the entire interconnection. We aren't looking down into the, into the gory details of the operational um, landscape. Um, the other thing that we want to mention is that this is an interconnection wide look and there's an extreme amount of value in looking across the entire interconnection, but we also break it down into some sub-regional areas. Um, this is just one puzzle piece in this resource adequacy puzzle. And um, 
it fits in with some of the other stuff that you're going to hear today, but also some of the other work going on um, across the interconnection. So if you go to the next slide, there are three characteristics of this analysis that I want to point out. The first is that it is an energy-based approach, and we do this to account for that variability. So rather than discounting the capacity and what we're looking at, we're actually just looking at the energy, and we're looking at the energy of all resources so that um, we can account for that variability. It's another way of doing it um, in addition to the capacity-based approach. The second characteristic is that we use a probabilistic approach. And we really do this to be able to look at the probability of things happening on the system, of demand and resources not lining up um, across multiple scenarios. So we're really looking at the probability of risk to the system. And again, this helps us account for that variability because we can look at a wide range of potential combinations of demand and resources. And then finally, this is an hourly analysis where we're examining every hour over the next uh, over the next 10 years. And this really helps us identify where is the system really being most strained. Um, next slide. So I'm going to jump into um, uh, into our analysis a little bit. And let me start by saying that we receive data every single year from entities that we designate as balancing authorities. And this is a designation that we give to entities who are responsible for balancing the load and generation in their footprint according to our mandatory reliability standards. Uh, so a balancing authority roughly lines up with the IOU. There's a lot of overlap, meaning a lot of IOUs or investor-owned utilities are balancing authorities, but it's, there's not 100% connection there. Um, but these are big entities typically, and they are responsible for the balancing of that load and resource within their footprint. So every year they send us information on their expected demand and resource availability every hour for the next 10 years. And so we get those numbers from them. We get some other information that helps us fill out um, how we account for imports. And that's the data from which we conduct our analysis. Now, what you're seeing on this slide is a, a very simplified illustration of what we do for every hour of the year for every entity from whom we get data. Um, our data does cover the entire Western interconnection um, from those BAs. So we do see everything in the, inter in the interconnection that way. But what you're seeing here is we take that expected value. So January 17th, 2027 at two o'clock in the morning, we're expecting, uh, based on what the entities are telling us, 100 megawatts of demand, and we're expecting to have 120 megawatts of resources available. That's what those two vertical lines represent, is that expected number that we're getting from the entity. If you look at the horizontal line running between those two vertical lines, this, is, this represents our planning reserve margin. So that reserve margin that, that we plan into the system to account for those unforeseen circumstances or those, those deviations from what's expected. And in this case, uh, the example is very neat and tidy and it works out to a 20% planning reserve margin. But what we wanna focus on here is that spot down below that planning reserve margin line where these two curves overlap. And that's where you run into um, the risk area. Because if you draw your dot in there for demand, it may be above the dot you would have for resource availability. So if you have 111 megawatts of demand, you could have 109 megawatts of resource availability, and then you come up short in terms of serving load. So our goal is to keep that overlap underneath um, some kind of reliability risk threshold, some comfort level. And for us, we use the one day and 10 year threshold, which is about a 99.97% threshold. So we wanna make sure that that area is below that 99.97%. This, so these curves can change. If you go to the next slide in our very simplified example, we see the curves move together. We've reduced our planning reserve margin to 10 megawatts. Um, but we've increased the overlap between those two curves, and it's gone above our risk tolerance threshold. And so when this happens on any given hour, we flag that hour. And I'll show you what we do with all those flagged hours in just a moment. But what we're flagging is the risk. This is an hour where there is the potential risk for loss of load. Now, as you look at these two curves, if everything works out as expected, or close to as expected, we're not in a load loss situation. So there is a low probability of load loss, but there is a risk of load loss. And that's why we're flagging the hour because that risk goes above our tolerance for risk. 
So we take all of these um, hours that we flag and we put them all into a couple of different charts. And if you go to the next slide, we'll see the first kinds of charts that we put these into. The lines on these charts each represent one of those hours where that overlap was just too great and the hour was flat. And the length of the line shows the magnitude of, of the potential loss of load. So if you look at the longest line here on the left hand side, you'll see it occurs at the end of August and it's over 5000 megawatts. So in that hour, there was some probability, albeit probably very small, there's some probability of a loss of load around the 5000 megawatt mark. Now on the left hand side, what you're seeing is a calculation of all those hours using a smaller uh, planning reserve margin. So a 13.6% planning reserve margin. That's one that we pick based on, uh, it's calculated based on the peak hour for the region um, or for the entire Western interconnection because these, these numbers cover the entire West. On the right hand side, we bump the planning reserve margin up to sort of the typical 15%. Um, and as you can see, we see a pretty stark reduction in the number of hours that we have uh, a risk where there could be a loss of load. Uh, I think in this example, we go from about 600 hours on the left to uh, around 80, 85 hours on the right one. When we presented these results in, in our 2020 analysis, we were asked, well, wait, what planning reserve margin would we need to have zero or close to zero hours uh, where there's a potential for loss of load? So we did that calculation. And if you go to the next slide, we'll show you what that comes up with. So this slide represents a little bit of what we saw in the last slide. If you take a look at the bottom right hand corner of this slide, you see that 598 hours at risk. That correlates with the 13.6 uh, PRM. And as you move up where we increase the PRM to 15%, you see that middle horizontal line and that intersects with the curve at the 89 hour mark. And that's where we saw that reduction of hours at risk. If we move up further and we track this curve up to the point where we're close to zero hours at risk, we're getting um, a planning reserve margin requirement of 16.9%. And that's what we're just calling our total reliability PRM. Um, and so for the entire interconnection, if we had an interconnection-wide planning reserve margin, which we don't, um, that reserve margin, uh, we may want to consider increasing that reserve margin a little bit. There's a little flag here that says we might be a little bit under um, if we have only a 13.6 or a 15% planning reserve margin. So this just gives you an idea of the analysis that we that we perform for each or for the Western interconnection as well as the subregions. So you go to the next slide. Um, these are the five subregions that we break it down into. Now we do look at the entire interconnection and the results we've just shown you are really sort of a byproduct of that analysis. When we look across the interconnection, it's not because we believe that there is or should be an interconnection wide planning reserve margin um, or that we think that planning resources happens on the interconnection wide scale. We know it doesn't. Um, so we look interconnection wide to really look for those hot spots. But to dig down into the details, we look at the sub-regional level, or, or to put it more correctly, we look down at the individual entity level and then aggregate our results back up to the sub-regional level because of some confidentiality um, issues with the data that we're using. So we present our results at the, at the sub-regional level. And what this is showing you is for these five sub-regions, and you can see Washington is up there in the Northwest Power Pool Northwest sub-region. I think we're looking for a name change in that since they have changed their name. Um, but that's where Washington is sitting. And you can see that we have our that total reliability planning reserve margin for each of the next four years, as well as 2031 for each of the sub-regions. And what I would point out here is not so much the numbers themselves, but the magnitude of the increase in some of these numbers. And I would point in this case to the California, Mexico subregion. Um, in 2031 on the far right there, they're at a 28.1% according to our analysis. That's our way of saying that they need around a 28% planning reserve margin to have close to zero hours that are at risk for loss of load. This is not our way of saying to the California PUC and the CEC, hey, go tell, go tell your entities that they have to have 28% planning reserve margin. But it is our way of saying, look, there may be a pretty major issue here of which they are aware, and there's more that needs to be looked into. 
Uh, so if we go to the next slide, I want to dig into the Northwest Power Pool Northwest region. I'll just call it the Northwest region because that's where you all are situated. And talk a little bit about the numbers that we're seeing there. Uh, so these charts are back. And what we're seeing here is with the 13.9% planning reserve margin, which if we took the peak load for the entire area and we calculated the planning reserve margin based on the peak load hour, we would come up with a 13.9% plan and reserve margin to stay within our risk tolerance threshold. And if you do that, we're looking at a fair number of hours, um, roughly 2,100 hours at risk, and the greatest magnitude of that risk reaching just over 4,000 megawatts. When we increase the planning reserve margin to that 15%, we still see quite a number of hours at risk, roughly um, around 1,300 hours at risk. So there is a reduction, but we're certainly nowhere close to eliminating the hours at risk. Now this is for 2022 and it is for that Northwest um, subregion. And this is based on that data that we received um, and the analysis we conducted um, the middle to, to late last year. So we go to the next slide in answer to the question, well, what planning reserve margin would help us get to that zero hour mark or close to zero hour mark? We're looking at a 23.9 basically 24% planning reserve margin. Now, again, this isn't our way of saying go out and get a 24% planning reserve margin, but it is an indication that we need to take a, a closer look at um, what the planning reserve margins are in the area. And I will say, this is still an aggregated number. So it may be that most of the entities in the footprint are just fine. And maybe it's one or two entities that really need to take a look at their planning reserve margins. We can't see that in this sub-regional analysis, um, although WEC does see that information when we do the analysis. And we share that information with individual entities. Um, so next slide, please. Here's one additional way of looking at the data um, because we have to talk about imports. One of the strengths of the Western interconnection is our ability to import and move power across the interconnection so we can leverage the really rich diversity that we have. And that's how our system was designed and that's how it was built. So we do have to talk about imports. So one of the things we do um, in sort of the scientific part of our analysis is we take all the imports away. And we just take a look at each of those individual subregions to see what happens if they have to stand by themselves. It's more of an academic exercise, but it allows us to see the starkness of the risk when we, when we add the imports back in. So on this slide, if you look at the upper left-hand corner, you're going to see a chart here that shows the demand at risk in terms of hours um, for the next four years and in three different snapshots. In this case, the subregion has to stand all by itself. It cannot import any energy for this chart. Um, and the bar on the left, that's with existing resources. So anything that was in the ground and operational as of, of mid 2021. The bar in the middle, that orange reddish colored bar um, is everything that's existing plus anything that was under construction or what we call our tier one resource additions. And then the gold bar is, the first two plus anything that any project that is not yet under construction, but it's not just conceptual, so it's in the siting phase. Um, and you can see as you add those resources in, not surprisingly, the number of hours at risk goes down. And so you see those bars go down. The same information is being displayed on the top right chart, except it's being displayed in terms of gigawatt hours, just to give you a little taste of both the number of hours at risk and the magnitude of, of energy that's at risk. On the bottom two charts, we've added imports back in based on the information we're getting from entities and the way that we model imports. And again, not surprisingly, we are seeing a pretty stark reduction um, in the number of hours and, and energy at risk. But what I would point out is there isn't a complete elimination of hours at risk. Even with all the resources that are currently planned being built by 2025, we still see almost 40 hours where demand is at risk. Now, what this isn't showing is when that risk is, it could be two o'clock in the morning, and we're not seeing um, the magnitude of the individual hours at risk. But the point being, there are some hours at risk, even with imports. And the lesson here is really that for areas that rely heavily on imports, and the Northwest is not one of them, um, and some of the other sub-regional charts we're seeing, uh, we're not seeing a, a very big reduction. We're seeing very high numbers, even after imports, um, but that, Areas really need to start thinking about 
how much are we relying on imports and can we continue to rely that heavily on imports just to be resource adequate? Um, so we, they need to start looking, looking at those. So I'm gonna, um, I think I'll forge ahead on the last two and then open it up for questions because we just have some takeaways. So if you go to the, la the next slide here, we've got our takeaways. I've talked about some of these um, in terms of analyzing, in terms of energy, uh, which is what, what we're doing. And that is in addition to capacity, um, evaluating the most strain time on the system, which is not necessarily the peak hour anymore. Um, and the way that I think about this is going to get a workout when you jump on the bike and if you just go full bore, uh, maximum heart rate for however long you go that you're working your body. Um, but apparently, <laughs> I don't know, but apparently doing interval training where you're going fast and slow and your heart rate is coming up and going down um, is it's strained your body and therefore supposedly is a, a better workout. The same, it, it's analogous to the system. We believe that during times of great variability, is when the system is now more strained. We're prepared for the peak. We have everything turned on. We're ready to meet the peak demand. It's the times off the peak, whether that's the, the shoulder seasons of, of fall and spring or the shoulder hours of the day. Uh, we are talking a lot with folks about recalibrating their planning reserve margins when there are substantial changes. Uh, variability is like dropping a rock in a pond and you drop, you drop a resource onto the system and there's gonna be some ripple effect. The question is, is that ripple effect big enough to change the system in such a way that you should be recalibrating your planning reserve margin? Um, we're not saying this is a real time recalibration. We're not even saying this is a seasonal necessarily, but as necessary. And then evaluating how imports are relied on. And I, I already mentioned that one. So if you go to the last slide here, these are some recommendations um, that, we, that we share with folks, sort of at the interconnection wide level um, and really, starting with this recognition that resource adequacy is a regional issue. And a lot of entities and bodies have recognized this, but we do still have some that are not quite convinced. I think that this is a regional issue. Um, and it's a regional issue because the issue has changed. Variability has changed the game, both on the load side and on the resource side. And so that recognition is, is pretty key. Um, increased collaboration and coordination, which we're seeing, you're going to hear from some folks today um, on this front, uh, particularly the Northwest Power Pool, excuse me, the Western Power Pools um, Resource Adequacy Program, I think is a great example of this increased coordination that we're seeing. Um, and then we need a really good understanding of the various studies and, and work that's out there, what their significance is um, and how we use their findings and how each of them fills in the big picture. I think Sometimes the knee jerk reaction is these studies are contradictory when in reality, I think that they're saying different things about different aspects of the resource adequacy issue. Um, so good understanding of those various studies is, is absolutely key. And then reconciling the short term and long term considerations. When I started playing around and talking about the resource adequacy um, issue years ago, I was always told, well, that's a long term issue. That's long term planning in the 10 year time frame. And, and what we're seeing is that is not how we need to be thinking about resource adequacy any longer, that, that this is a short term up to long term issue, which complicates it just a little bit. So with that, um, just some information on how you can uh, get more, more information um, on our resource adequacy work. You can visit WEC.org and our popular searches, click on the Western Assessment of Resource Adequacy link. And then we're also hosting a resource adequacy webinar series. Uh, there will be five or six in this series. We've, we've given you the titles of the first three here. Um, they'll occur on the first Wednesday of the month, starting in July. And that first one will be on July 6th. It will cover the landscape in the West. And we've got some different folks from different walks of the, P of the really source adequacy life, um, talking a little bit about their role, what, how they conduct resource planning, um, their challenges and considerations. Then we'll move on to that comparative overview of assessments in August. And then in September, we'll be talking about an, an analysis we're doing right now, comparing the resources that have been planned over the last several years uh, against what's actually been built and taking a look at any risks associated with um, Hey, gaps. Randy. Um, okay, and with that, just our contact information, and, and I'd love to open it up for questions. I think um, I saw some ticking along in the in the and chat, I, but I don't know, Glenn, how you want to handle these. Yeah, um, I, we'll, uh, we'll see what we can get to in the chat, but um, I, I wanted to uh, squeeze a couple in myself first. Um, could you roll it back to 17, slide 17? 
Connor. All right, what I'm going to do when we get it to 17 is, um, I, the, um, I, I wanted to draw people's attention to the, the scales on the upper and lower charts, and um, that the difference that uh, transmission or imports uh, makes um, to the the um, the resource adequacy or the you know the risk um, we're seeing it like on the right hand side in 2025 3000 gigawatt hours that's at risk without transmission and um, 90 is that right yeah mm -hmm. so that's a that's a very big difference and, and uh, i mean it seems to be that way in the uh, not not just in 2025, but across the board. Um, and then I um, would would we see if you know this is measuring if the northwest subregion were isolated from the rest of the west, you know how much we would lose in terms of uh, you know being able to maintain resource adequacy. Would we see a similar sort of phenomenon if we were to look at each balancing area separately from the balancing area next door to it? You know, like if Seattle City Light and Tacoma weren't able to uh, exchange resources, import or export, would we see the, the numbers uh, enlarge as well? Yeah, and depending on which entity you'd be looking at, some um, depend more heavily on imports than others to, to be resource adequate. And, and depending on imports is perfectly fine to be resource adequate. Um, but different entities depend more heavily than others on, on imports to be resource adequate. And so you would see some of these numbers, not to that scale, because because this is a sub-regional aggregation, but you would see similar behavior in some cases. In other cases, some of our entities are much more self-sufficient um, you know, if, if they had to be. So it's yeah. kind of a range. Okay. And then I think, uh, Commissioner Rendall, uh, did you have a question? I do, and, and thank you for asking that question about uh, the individual balancing authorities, Glenn, because I think that that's... Um, there is that data, but um, WEC has access to that data because it's it's able to hold it confidentially. It's not something that's shared broadly across the West. The question I wanted to ask is, um, Victoria and Connor, thank you for this presentation. It's excellent. Um, the commission and the um, Department of Commerce and the governance office received a letter from the Washington Public Utility Districts Association last week in which they asked uh, in the context of this resource adequacy work that we are responsible for in this, this workshop to, um, they asked us to um, prepare together with, a, um, with input from a stakeholder advisory group, a detailed analysis of grid, reliabil grid reliability using a robust electric grid simulation model um, looking 5, 10, 20 years into the future, and including the various public policies that have been adopted in the state, as well as considering banning natural gas use in the home. So various scenarios, um, including, you know, removal of dams and other hydro resources. So uh, just, but just for Washington's grid. So is this the kind of information that WEC is capable, this kind of work that capable that WEC is capable of doing, or if not, um, given that you have access to the confidential information, um, is this the kind of work that WEC could do for a region or a subregion? Um, and if not, who would you suggest uh, would have that modeling uh, capability and technical capacity to do this kind of work? Yeah, so let me um, speak kind of broadly to, to a couple of things with WEC, and then I'm going to ask Matthew Elkins to respond on the capabilities of narrowing the analysis down to just the Washington state level. I think he, he can give you a better answer on that than I can. But I would say one of the, the things that 
we have that, a benefit that we have that sometimes the states don't have is that we look um, not just at regulated, we look at the public. So we have information that covers the entire footprint. So that's one of the benefits. Uh, we do have that information and you did mention the confidentiality um, issues with some of that information. Um, it is information that, that we can share with the entities. In terms of being able to analyze down to that level, um, Matthew, can you just address that question as to, could we narrow our scope of our analysis uh, down to that, to, to the Washington state level? Uh, yeah, sure. So can you hear me okay, just to make sure? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so definitely, I think, uh, you know, with some modifications to the model, uh, you know, at first we set it up just to be a high level thing. Uh, it is getting a lot more attention and, and there's there's discussions of we want to see that entity specific data and I think we could. Um, and, I, you know, I think the idea here is that you have to run these probabilistic ones, but then if you want to do like studies like you're talking about, Commissioner, you'd want to do, you know, production dispatch models or production cost models is what they have out there, the deterministic ones. You take a lot of these extreme conditions, you run them through those to kind of see what those what would be the impact of droughts? What would be the impact of those kind of things? <clears throat> Excuse me. There's um, you know, there's other models that that can do. Uh, you know, John Fazio is coming up next. Northwest Power and Conservation Council. They they have the skills as well. Um, you you mentioned if there's anyone else, I would recommend. Uh, a lot of the consulting companies out there right now, um, really getting into this. But I think it's it's really just you'd have to scope out exactly what you wanted to do and which model would be the best to do that. Because um, again, probabilistic studies, it, it takes a lot of computing power, runtime, those kind of things. So, but uh, yeah, I mean, definitely somewhere we want to go. We want to partner with uh, individuals and, and, and have that kind of ability. So, right. And my primary concern is that access to that confidential data across the various balancing authorities, whether they're investor owned utilities or um, consumer and utilities over which the commission doesn't have jurisdiction. And sharing of that data has been a, a conflict issue across the West for a long time. And so that's something that sort of makes me concerned about whether we would have the capacity to do that. So thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Yeah, you bet. Uh, we're, we're only going to have time for uh, one more question. And what I'm going to do is uh, uh, pull out from uh, the several questions that we have, uh, one that I think reflects um, several of those. And, and that is, um, where do you get the information about the loads uh, when you're doing this assessment? And to what extent do you reflect both uh, state policies that might affect the demand for electricity and also the uncertainty about um, what the loads might be in the future. So not just uncertainty that's from um, like the fluctuation in weather, but uh, uncertainty about uh, you know whether the state policies might cause load to uh, either go down because of a lot of energy efficiency or go up because of a lot of policy-driven electrification. Yeah, so really briefly before I turn over to Matthew to talk about what they do with the data and to the data, we get our data from those balancing authorities. And so we ask them to give their most recent approved IRP data to us. And so if they have an IRP because they're a regulated entity, they'll give us their IRP, but they also gather the information from anybody under their umbrella. Um, we assume in doing so that they are accounting for those those policies because we are asking for that approved IRP. What we recognize is that sometimes that IRP, because we're asking for only approved IRP data, that may be a couple years old. And so they may not, uh, if there's been a policy change in those two years, we, we recognize that there may be some gaps in there. Um, but that's where we're getting all the load and resource information from. Now we do something to that data when we get it. And I'll let Matthew talk about about how they handle the data, how they account for different things, including things like retirements. Yeah, no, exactly right. And I'll be I'll be brief. Um, so, uh, like like Victoria was saying, a lot of the the forecasting is done elsewhere for demand and stuff. So we don't put in the, the demand forecasting. But I think what I saw a lot of those chat questions getting at is how how do you account for the growing variability around 
the de demand forecast. And that's the hardest part of this because of those distributions that we have that we showed earlier, those are really what we're trying to get at is how, how wide are those variabilities getting? At this time, what we do is we just use, here's the variability that we've seen as of today. Um, and then we apply that going forward for the next 10 years. So if as that variability changes, um, you can see those ranges changing, you can see that, but it's hard to predict, uh, you know, how the electrification and those kind of things will cause the variability to shift. So uh, can't be perfect at everything, but uh, you know, we definitely understand that it's something to keep an eye on always. So. All right. Well, thank you very much. And um, we really appreciate your presentation today. And uh, it's gonna, I think, really be helpful as we move through uh, the discussion to, uh, to see this um, authoritative region-wide uh, industry-driven approach. So uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you for inviting us. What I'd like to do now is um, switch to um, our regional power planning entity, the Northwest Power and Conservation Council. John Fazio is uh, joining us today uh, to present on the, the work that's done within the Northwest on uh, on resource adequacy. Um, John, I will turn it over to you and welcome. Thank you very much. I'm uh, assuming that uh, you can all see my screen, I hope. I can see your screen. I Perfect. Can hear your audio. You're, you're ready to roll. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, Yes, I'm uh, John Fazio. I am a uh, systems analyst for the Northwest Power and Conservation Council. We've been around since 1980, 81, something like that. Um, and uh, part of our function is to produce a power plan, regional power plan for the uh, Pacific Northwest region, which covers uh, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and that part of Montana, uh, west of the Rockies. And today, uh, I will briefly touch on these three topics, I hope. Uh, there's, uh, there's an awful lot of material when you talk about adequacy, obviously. Uh, but I want to uh, describe, a lot of you have seen this, but I'd like to describe uh, the Council's resource adequacy standard. Um, the Council has been doing probabilistic uh, adequacy assessments since 1999. Uh, it has a standard. Uh, it may not, it has been very... Uh, useful for the region uh, for the last uh, 23 years or so, uh, but we are looking to uh, for better ways uh, to assess risk to customers, and I'll talk about that later. But the second item I want to talk about is how resource adequacy fits into the development of the power plan, and then I'll give you a quick summary of, of the 2021 power plan, which was just completed uh, a few months ago. So uh, moving ahead, let's uh, discuss how the council assesses resource adequacy for the Northwest. Uh, we use a Monte Carlo simulation program. Monte Carlo just means that um, as one, as you might consider, uh, we roll the dice uh, on future uncertainties. Uh, the model uh, performs an, a chronological hourly simulation of all the resources in the Northwest and it models um, uh, market conditions outside of the Northwest. Uh, as I said before, we um, we take a future operating year. Uh, we simulate, we choose um, random conditions, um, river flows, temperature, which affect loads, uh, solar generation. Uh, we have many different um, patterns of solar generation based on historical uh, based on synthetic uh, wind, uh, wind patterns. Uh, of course, we model forced outages on thermal units. And we run thousands of simulations. Um, and then we keep track of how often uh, we fail to meet load. Uh, the model records all the hours when we don't meet demand. And then the metric that the council uses for adequacy is something that we call the annual loss of load probability. Um, it's very simple to calculate. Uh, we just uh, count up the number of simulations that have at least one shortfall and divide by the total number of simulations uh, that we run. Um, in, in English, <laughs> what we're saying 
is that the council deems the power supply to be adequate if the likelihood of having one or more shortfalls in a future year is less than or equal to 5%. And I'll talk later about some of the limitations of this metric. However, there is one uh, caveat or one warning that, that is very important. Even though uh, loss of load is in the name of our metric, it doesn't really mean blackout or actual loss of load because the model can't possibly, we can't possibly model every single contingency action and operations that the, that the region can take in order to keep the lights on. I'm talking about things like uh, perhaps uh, undeclared um, generators um, um, or uh, buyback provisions that we don't know about, or even having the governor come on, on TV and saying, please conserve your energy. So the loss of load probability set to 5% doesn't mean that we anticipate that we're planning for a system that will fail 5% of the time. It's just that the tolerance, what it really means, a more accurate definition, is that it's the likelihood of having to take non-modeled emergency actions to keep the lights on, which sometimes can be very expensive and which actually happened in 2001. So our standard is a 5% loss of load probability. Um, but I want to now, um, describe to you how we use that adequacy standard uh, in developing the power plan. And this is a very simplified version of, of the process. We go through very elaborate process, took us four years almost to the last power plan for a number of reasons. One of them is that uh, we chose this time for the first time to use uh, forward-looking uh, climate change adjusted projections for river flows and temperatures and even wind directions uh, and wind generation, as opposed to using historical data that we've been using in the past. We have a historical record of water flows, we have historical temperatures, et cetera. We do observe a, uh, a trend in, in the historical data of increasing temperatures. Uh, the, the increase in temperature can affect um, adequacy. And uh, the council chose this time to use uh, th these climate change projections looking forward because it believes that uh, it's a better projection of future conditions than using historical data. So nonetheless, here we start. We start with a load forecast. We have we count up our resources, energy efficiency, supply curves, and there's a ton of other data. And we run all of this information through the Genesis model, which is our adequacy model. And we calculate three things that we send uh, to our uh, system expansion model. Uh, we, we basically calculate um, resource needs, you know, we, we assess how much capacity is required to maintain adequacy. Uh, we actually we calculate an adequacy reserve margin, which is essentially the same thing as a planning reserve margin that was discussed in the presentation just uh, before this one uh, that WEC made. Uh, we also uh, calculate something that's called um, the um, it's basically the, the effective load carrying capacity of resources or the ca capacity contribution that resources provide. As also was mentioned earlier, uh, if you have a 100 megawatt nameplate uh, solar uh, or wind farm, uh, you can't count on 100 megawatts to be there all the time. And so Genesis also provides us an estimate of the firm or uh, um, the firm capacity or the amount of capacity that we can count on for planning purposes. All of this data goes to our system expansion model, which is called the regional portfolio model, and it will build resources uh, if they're required by law, <clears throat> clean air laws and uh, renewable portfolio standards, uh, or if a resource is expected to be profitable, or if it's needed for adequacy, namely if it's needed to meet the adequacy reserve margin, or another word for it is the planning reserve margin. But this is not the only thing we do. Uh, we do this for a number of different scenarios because the Genesis model uh, doesn't account for every possible future condition. Uh, besides the baseline condition, we may want to look at an early coal retirement scenario or, or a scenario where some resources are retired early. You might want to look at, uh, let's say, an organized uh, market scenario across the West Coast, which essentially is means that um, uh, it sets up a situation where uh, it facilitates the sharing of exist existing resources 
Uh, and we also look at other scenarios. One of the scenarios that we looked at was a partial decarbonization scenario uh, where the loads in the Pacific Northwest uh, rose significantly. Uh, we didn't do a complete decarb. We didn't go to 100%, but we went to one where the loads went up by about 30%. And we did other scenarios. So the council uh, asked the staff to run all of these scenarios through Genesis and through the regional portfolio model. And then it looks at all of the results from all of these scenarios uh, and uh, it builds its resource strategy that goes into uh, the 2021 power plan. So it isn't like we as staff uh, just go up there, push a button, let, let the model run and it spits out uh, the power plan. Uh, it involves uh, a lot of um, some a lot of discussion a lot of judgment and a lot of feedback from our stakeholders all of these all of this is all done in a public forum so um, let's take a look at what we see going forward well this graph shows the uh, announced coal retirements uh, from 2018 through the next decade or so and we can see that uh, that uh, quite a number of uh, quite a lot of capacity from coal is expected to be retired, uh, and and uh, this could this could move up. Uh, we could eventually uh, lose uh, all coal retirement. Uh, at the same time, if we look at loads, and this chart shows uh, the uh, annual, uh, not the capacity, but the annual energy load for the Northwest. The units here are average megawatts, which are kind of odd uh, for those who don't understand that. Uh, one average megawatt is uh, 8,760 megawatt hours. It's one megawatt for every hour of the year. So the, the loads in the Northwest region are on the order of 20,000 average megawatts. And as you can see from the notation on the right, uh, that uh, by 2027, uh, we have quite a range of potential uh, either load growth or load decline, uh, about a, a plus or minus uh, four to five percent range. And by 2041, it increases to about a plus or minus seven or eight percent. But this does not include uh, any, uh, any um, um, indirect uh, effects of climate change like population uh, in, uh, inflow due to uh, the Northwest, due to uh, more drastic climates in other regions and people want to move into the Northwest, uh, nor does it include uh, uh, this forecast, doesn't include uh, any increased uh, demand due to future electrification policies or actions. However, as I said before, we did look at one scenario, and I'll show you the results of that, uh, where we did a, um, a partial decarbonization. But before we get to the results, um, we recognized uh, a few years ago that, that the Genesis model that we developed in 1999 uh, needed to be improved. And I'm not going to dwell on this. You can read this yourself. But basically, we needed to get a more granular model, a model that had more detail. Um, in particular, we wanted to be able to model uh, hydro projects on an hourly basis explicitly. Uh, and, I, and we also wanted to model uh, uh, more of the transmission constraints in the Northwest and across the West. Uh, we wanted to do more of a dynamic assessment of market prices and market availability uh, because that clearly affects uh, uh, the dispatch of Northwest resources. Um, and uh, let me just say that uh, this question didn't come up, but in this particular model, uh, we have something on the order of 15,000 um, operating constraints on about 80 hydro projects. Uh, it's very detailed um, hydro simulation. And what we've discovered is that, that if you don't model the hydro correctly, you may, um, in, like in some other west-wide models, I, I'm not saying that they're bad, I'm just saying that if they, they often uh, can overestimate the flexibility of the hydro system, which means that they might underestimate or underbuild um, uh, the system to maintain adequacy. So uh, quick results. Uh, I don't have um, a resource adequacy assessment per se. Uh, uh, we try to do that every year uh, because of the power plan that got delayed. Um, normally, we come out with a heat map that shows what the loss of load probability would be under different uh, load conditions and under different market conditions. Um, 
the, but what I can show you are the resource needs uh, assessment results that we that we uh, have for the 21 power plan. Uh, the chart that I'm showing you here shows for the 2020s and for the 2030s uh, the uh, capacity needed, and this is pure capacity I'm talking about, not nameplate, uh, the capacity required uh, to maintain adequacy um, under three different scenarios. And I just chose three because I, they were convenient. Uh, I'm showing the uh, organized market scenario, the early coal retirement scenario, and the red one on top is the are the resource needs under a partial decarbonization scenario in which loads go up about 30% or 35%. So as you can see, clearly, it's very intuitive. If loads go up, we need we need more resources to meet those loads. Um, you may ask what an organized market scenario is. I kind of addressed that earlier, but it's basically a wet. It basically we're assuming that Westwide utilities take a unified approach to planning for new resources. They use a common adequacy standard and common transmission rates. Uh, this benefits the Pacific Northwest. It benefits everyone because it facilitates the sharing of Westwide resources. It's not. It's kind of like an assumption of of if you applied like what the power pools uh, resource adequacy program spread across the entire West. Um, of course, this assumes everybody will cooperate. We know that's that will that's an easy thing to do, right? <laughs> um, that was winter. Uh, we have take a quick look at summer, uh, kind of the same. Uh, one thing that we are noticing is that with climate change data, uh, we're, we see a trend of potential problems shifting from winter to summer. And that's a clear indication of the, of the effects of temperature increase. Um, uh, what we see is that with higher temperatures, um, precipitation in the fall comes down more as rain instead of snow, which means that we have more water in the river system, which gives us more hydro generation. At the same time, with higher temperatures, our demand in the winter goes down, so that's good. In the summer, the opposite happens, where because of a smaller snowpack, we have less water in the river, we have lower hydro generation, and at the same time, with higher temperatures, we have higher demand due to AC loads going up. So uh, over time, even if you look, even if you use historical data, you see this trend occurring uh, that over time in general, every year is different. There's a lot of variability, but in, over time in general, we see this shift in the Northwest of problems, uh, more of the winter problems shifting over into summer. I'm just trying to keep a track on time here. So I, I try to get in at 10, 15. So here are the results from the 20, 2021 power plan. Again, I won't um, spend too much time here, uh, but uh, there's no gas, there's no uh, fossil fuel uh, resource uh, in our plan. Um, there's uh, energy efficiency, uh, 750 to 1,000 average megawatts uh, for five years from now with 2,400 by the end of the 20 year period. Lots of renewables, 3,500 megawatts by 2027 and more after that plus the pursuit of uh, low cost demand response measures, uh, voltage regulation, time of use rates, et cetera, et cetera. So we're trying to, the, the plan really says, look, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, potential resources out there that are not uh, fossil fuel uh, fired that we can use and maintain an adequate supply. Um, so that's a snapshot. Our plan is online. There's a lot of detail there. Uh, we do the plan every five years, and then every year we do a resource adequacy assessment. The next assessment we hope is due, can, will come out later this year. Um, and then to wrap up, um, this, is, this process has worked well for us for the last uh, 20 years or so, uh, but we can do better. Uh, and it's important because the 5% the loss of load probability um, has worked well, but it has its limitations. And so one of the things that we want to do is to look at perhaps different metrics or different ways of measuring adequacy. And the panel that's coming up after this presentation is going to discuss that in detail. The trouble with LOLP, I think the easiest way to uh, to illustrate this is to take two extreme cases, which, some, which can be absurd, uh, but I think that it highlights the limitations. So remember, the loss of load probability uh, only measures the likelihood that a future year will have at least one shortfall. 
It doesn't measure the magnitude, the duration, or even the frequency of that shortfall. So let's take one case. In the first case, uh, this case would be deemed adequate, but it really isn't. Let's say that in one out of every 20 years, in that one year, we have total curtailment, blackout for the entire year. Based on the 5% LLP uh, metric, that system would be adequate, but clearly it's not. Now that's absurd because that would never happen, but it illustrates that one limitation. On the other end, um, a, a system that we might deem inadequate, but really is, is a case where in every year you may have a one megawatt outage in one hour. In that case, we would count every single year as a problem year, and the LLP would be 100%, even though most people would say, well, that's not really a problem. And so this is just a, a sort of a stark illustration of the limitations of the loss of load probability. And so we're thinking of improving that. And how do you improve it? Well, one way is to measure uh, the frequency, duration, and magnitude of potential shortfall events. And there are some metrics already out there. NERC has been uh, recording these metrics for a decade. Uh, WEC calculates these and sends them to, to NERC. Uh, we calculate, we've been calculating these for over a decade too. Uh, one of them is called the loss of load events, which is basically just the frequency. It's an annualized version of the frequency of potential events. Loss of load hours mentioned uh, earlier uh, or something related to that, which is the expected num number of hours of shortfall per year. And then of course, the magnitude, which is the expected unserved energy. Uh, we can also look at shorter temporal periods and we can also perhaps look at metrics for resiliency, which are, um, are unlikely events, but very high impact events. So how do we do this? Well, one approach to, to doing this is, and, and picking the metrics is easy. The hard part is setting the thresholds. For example, what is, um, how many loss of load hours would, would equate to an adequate supply? Um, how big an, an outage uh, uh, can we allow and still call the system to be um, adequate? So one way to do it uh, very briefly would be to say, well, let's look at all of the emergency actions uh, that we have in our toolbox to keep the lights on. Uh, all utilities have these contingency actions. If we can somehow aggregate them all and we can say, well, here's the capability of our, our, of our emergency tool chest. It can provide this much capacity uh, uh, over the, these many hours, or in other words, it can provide that much energy. That defines the magnitude and duration of the event that we can handle with our emergency actions. We can then convert that magnitude and duration into annualized thresholds for these metrics like the loss of load hours and the expected unserved energy. Um, let me just go right to the next slide. There are two utilities in the Northwest in Washington who are already doing this. Tacoma Power and Seattle City Light. Uh, Tacoma Power is taking an annualized metric approach where they actually uh, have thresholds for EUE, LOLH and LOLEV. The Seattle City Light uh, takes an event-based standard where they're they're defining an event uh, that that if the if, if the expected shortfall event is larger than that or happens more often than that, then they would consider the system inadequate. And I think, given the time, um, the last slide is just a, a project timeline. It's just that we would like to. Uh, have the resource adequacy assessment for this year done by the end of this year. And if so, then you will see a report from the council uh, that has um, uh, an, an assessment of the resource adequacy probably for 2027, not just a single number, but as I said before, a heat map that shows uh, how, the, how the loss of load probability would change under different load and market conditions. But also we're going to report all of these other metrics um, and we hope to be able to come up with, uh, with perhaps a new standard where we actually set limits uh, for not just the loss of load probability, but also for the frequency, duration, and magnitude um, of events that we would consider um, unacceptable or undesirable. I know I don't. I went right to 10:15. I'm sorry, I didn't leave any time for questions, <laughs> but I do appreciate it. Well, and thank you, John. Um, I, I I'm going to squeeze one question in there here anyway, which is. Um, 
because you mentioned um, the, the effort that um, you go into about modeling the constraints on the hydro system. And um, at, there was a, you know, a little bit of comparison, I think, that you were suggesting from your analysis to, to the uh, west-wide analysis that occurs. And, and then we also got a, a, you know, a, a comment in the chat basically suggesting that the, the west-wide analysis wasn't giving enough credit to hydro flexibility. And yet it seemed like you were saying that um, you had some concern that the west-wide analysis was giving too much credit the hydro flexibility. I'm, I'm not as familiar with the WEC model um, as I am with GridView and with Plexos and with Aurora and with uh, some of these other models that are that are west-wide uh, production costing models or transmission models uh, in some cases. Uh, but uh, generally, my experience with those models is that they um, they try to uh, they either use historical hydro generation or or they try to uh, simulate uh, the operation based on some historical uh, records, uh, they tend to show more hydro flexibility than there really is. But there is a solution. And we've been working with those people. And that is we, we use our model, which has all of these constraints, like the fish and wildlife, the ESA constraints for uh, the biological opinion, et cetera, all of that. We run our model and we look at the flexibility, um, the daily flexibility, uh, high and low, and we record that. And then we build what we call kind of, um, well, someone has called it as training wheels, but I, <laughs> what it really is is a boundary that says, uh, this is the general range of flexibility that the hydro system has in the Northwest based on all of these constraints that we have. We feed that into these other models and say, uh, uh, simulate the hydro as you see fit in the Northwest, but make sure that it doesn't exceed these bounds, because if you do exceed those bounds, you might be violating some of these operating constraints. So there is a way to connect the models together. Uh, and in that case, even though they're not as detailed as a Northwest model, at least they can be, uh, I think, more accurate about the flexibility of the hydro. Okay, thanks. And I, one other thing that I wanted to ask you about was, um, I mean, when I think about the Northwest Power Planning Council, the first thing I think about is the, the, uh, that organization identifying energy efficiency as being on par with generation as a way to meet the, the demands of consumers in the Northwest. And that um, energy efficiency uh, often was a cheaper way to get what people actually needed and to build more and more power plants. When it comes to modeling resource adequacy and developing um, the resources that we need to, to meet you know, peak levels of demand, is the Power Council digging as deep on demand response as it did when it identified energy efficiency as a, a resource on par with generation we, we are trying. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, we understand that it could be a very valuable uh, resource moving forward. And we, we have a demand response uh, advisory committee that we set up a few years ago. So we're trying to put in as much effort as we did with energy efficiency. Uh, and yes, we agree it's very important. All right, great. Well, thanks. Um, the, um, there, there are still questions in the chat and I encourage people who, um, you know, uh, wish we had gotten to their question to follow up uh, outside of the meeting with our presenters, and uh, we're and we are you know keeping track of the questions, and we'll um, include those when we report back to the governor and the legislature uh, that you know there were questions along those lines. But what I'll do now is turn it over to Nora Hawkins, who's going to moderate the next panel. Thank you, Glenn. Hi, everyone. My name is Nora Hawkins, and I'm an energy policy specialist. I'm here today on behalf of the Washington Utilities and Transportation Commission, and I'm joined by my UTC colleagues, Jason Lewis and Joel Nightingale. 
I'm really excited about this next panel because we were able to bring together four of the leading experts on resource adequacy methodologies um, to be in conversation with one another. And this is a really important conversation because they'll be discussing some of the limitations of traditional RA metrics and will explain additional metrics that be, can be used to fill in the gaps that are often left by standard metrics and thus be able to present a more holistic view of the current adequacy of the system. Um, we'll be hearing from four different panelists today. Um, Gord Steven from National Renewable Energy Laboratory, Juan Paul Carvalho from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, Elaine Hart from Moment Energy, and Nick Schlag from E3 will be closing out with his presentation. So we'll have the four presentations and then an opportunity for dialogue and questions at the end. As Glenn said, please continue to um, put questions in the chat, raise your hand, we'll get to as many questions as we can, and hopefully have additional time this afternoon um, to get to additional questions. Um, finally, there will be a break at 11.15, so thank you all for hanging with us. Um, we will have a break right after this session. With that, I'll pass it over to you, Gord. Thank you all for being here today. Great. Thanks very much. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you just fine. Perfect. And I will share my screen. Can you see that as well? It looks great. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so hi, everyone. My name is Gord Steven. I'm a research engineer at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Uh, where a lot of my work focuses on uh, resource adequacy and resource adequacy assessment. Uh, over the past couple of years, I've been part of a uh, group within the Energy Systems Integration Group uh, called the Redefining Resource Adequacy Task Force. Uh, and we've been looking at uh, kind of how we do resource adequacy assessment today and how we might want to be uh, evolving that or adapting that given uh, the changes that we're seeing in the power system and uh, with an eye towards the power system needs uh, of the future. Uh, so we put out our first publication uh, last summer. Um, and then we are also in the process of uh, getting ready to present some follow-up work later this year uh, at Seagray. Uh, and the, what I'm going to present on today is uh, some of the high-level um, highlights from that follow-up work, uh, which is about uh, resource adequacy metrics, so it seemed like a good fit for this presentation or this panel. Uh, so the four high-level highlights uh, and sort of recommendations or suggestions uh, in that paper uh, are what you see here on the screen. Uh, John's already touched on a lot of these in, in, at some level of detail, so I'm not going to uh, belabor all of them necessarily, uh, but I'll, I'll go through the four, and then there's also a fifth uh, issue that uh, we raised in the paper that I wanted to take some time to discuss as well. So the first recommendation was to place greater emphasis on normalized expected unserved energy as um, a risk metric. So our second uh, recommendation is not to rely on a single metric, uh, but if you do need to pick one to focus more heavily on, we'd suggest that normalized expected underserved energy is a good one to pick. Uh, John already kind of went through why uh, metrics like LOL P um, and also metrics like LOLE and LOLH can sometimes uh, miss certain aspects of uh, shortfall and risk conditions. Um, just because you know that a certain event might happen with a certain frequency and maybe even you know it might be lasting three hours, you don't necessarily know whether that's three hours that's impacting one customer or a thousand or a million. And obviously those are very different situations and you want to treat each of those uh, very differently. Uh, so an energy-based metric like expected unserved energy captures the depth of the, the magnitude of those different shortfalls, um, but uh, presents it in terms of absolute energy units. Um, and if we're just talking about megawatt hours, that doesn't necessarily mean a lot without context of, you know, is that a large fraction of the total demand that we're trying to serve on the system or not? Um, so by normalizing that value, we get normalized expected unserved energy. We basically take that megawatt hour number and divide it by the total energy demand of the system overall to get a fraction. Uh, and then we can report that fraction and um, that is much easier to compare across systems of different size or even across uh, the same system at different points in time. Maybe moving into the future, you're expecting demand to increase. Um, and that lets you kind of do more apples to apples comparison uh, across time or even within a single analysis period if you want to report metrics for different seasons that maybe have different demand levels, for example. 
The second recommendation is to report a suite of metrics. John already talked a little bit about this too. Uh, the idea here is that if you're only looking at a single metric, you can miss certain aspects of the nature of the system risk that you're facing. Uh, and so by reporting a suite of metrics, we can actually see that same situation from multiple different perspectives and get more, uh, more insight and more understanding into what that shortfall really means and whether or not that's a risk that we're willing to accept or not. So I won't go into kind of walking through this, these specific examples, but uh, you can see that different shortfalls can look the same if you use certain metrics, but look different if you use other metrics. So looking across multiple metrics is an important way to capture um, all of those dimensions of the risk that you're facing. The third recommendation is about quantifying tail risks. Uh, so John hinted at this a little bit uh, when he was talking about resilience metrics like CVAR, uh, but the idea here is that uh, if we have a range of different potential outcomes, different things that could happen in the future, that's what we do when we do a probabilistic resource adequacy assessment. Uh, in, in this first example up here, the vast majority of cases we see there's, there's no, nothing bad happens. Uh, we don't have any shortfall. They're basically the severity of that future, however you might define severity, um, is, is basically zero. That, that's good, that's what we want. And then out here in the tails, we have um, some less likely situations to occur, uh, but it's still possible where we might be having a small shortfall or maybe in kind of the worst case, we have a slightly larger shortfall. Uh, but regardless, uh, the overall risk of the system, if you average across all of these different potential outcomes, may be relatively low because most of the time, nothing bad is happening. In the bottom, we see uh, a different distribution of outcomes that actually has the same average outcome. So if you average across all of these scenarios or uh, realizations on the bottom, uh, the number that you get for the average severity across all of these is the same as the top situation. But in this case, the vast, vast majority of situations have uh, no, uh, no problems, no shortfall, but then you end up with you know, maybe 98% of the time you're, you're great, everything's fine. But in that extra 2% of the time, things get really bad. Uh, and those are the worst case outcome associated with this distribution of outcomes on the bottom, uh, maybe much, much higher than the worst case situation with the top. Uh, and from a policy perspective, you, you may not be willing to entertain one of these scenarios over the other, or you may favor one of these distributions over the other. But by only looking at expectation kind of average metrics that average across all these outcomes, uh, you're not able to distinguish between these two situations. So using tail risk metrics uh, like CVAR that John mentioned is one way of getting statistics about what's going on out at the extremes and incorporating that in your decision making process as well as the average outcomes. And then finally, the fourth recommendation is to look at the nature of individual shortfall events. Um, so historically, we've thought a lot about capacity when we think about resource adequacy investments and mitigation. You know, we're 100 megawatts short. Let's go out and build a new combustion turbine in order to have that on standby. And maybe most of the time it's not going to be doing anything, but there's that one day of the year where we're going to need it and we'll run it. Uh, uh, in modern advancements, there's a lot of other options that we have available to us that might potentially serve that same resource adequacy need. Things like variable renewable resources, things like uh, batteries or other types of storage, things like demand response programs. These uh, could theoretically provide the same resource adequacy benefits, but these all come with extra complications. It takes a lot more information to know whether these types of resources will actually be available in the specific time periods that you're going to need them in the specific time periods where your system risk is occurring. Uh, so you can see, uh, we can think about when that system risk occurs into on the basis of individual shortfall events in terms of the time of year, in terms of uh, the time of day, in terms of how long a specific event might last and how deep that shortfall might be in terms of megawatts and whether that depth is sustained across the full shortfall event or not. And with this extra information, we can actually make an informed decision about whether a particular size of battery or a particular demand response program that we can only call a couple times a year would be an appropriate mitigation strategy to meet our resource adequacy needs instead of uh, kind of a more conventional capacity only uh, way of thinking about mitigation. So those are the four uh, high level kind of recommendations that came out of, of this paper. Uh, there's another issue that we wanted to raise. And I think this meeting is an excellent example of why this is important. 
And that's about the idea of uh, how we think about risk and, and communicate risk both within uh, utilities and within the power industry, as well as externally to stakeholders in broader society. So the four recommendations I just gave are basically all things that make a resource adequacy assessment more complicated. We're reporting more numbers. We're considering a, a different uh, ways of summarizing the range of outcomes that we could get. Uh, and all these things are very valuable information when it comes to informing decisions in new investments and, 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 and strategies for mitigating and handling risk moving into the future. But with that comes the greater challenge of how we actually communicate all of this kind of richer, um, more complicated uh, information and how that feeds into these more complicated considerations for what we're choosing to uh, invest in and how we're choosing to plan our power system in the future. So as an, as a, as an industry, I think the, the power sector has to grapple with this question and, and figure out how do we balance both the technical rigor and kind of the extra detail that we need to be thinking about when we do these studies with keeping the analysis that we're doing and we're using as justification for uh, investments in infrastructure, uh, uh, keeping that transparent and accessible to a wider range of stakeholders who have a vested interest in the decisions we're making and want to understand how and why we're justifying the decisions uh, that we're taking. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways to approach that. Uh, one particular one that I'll just uh, leave as kind of a, uh, an open question would be, I talked about expected unserved energy as a risk metric earlier in the presentation. You can do a resource adequacy study, you can come up with a number for EUE, um, but that number, that one piece of information can be reported in many different ways. So down here on the bottom, I have four bullets representing four different ways of representing what is actually the exact same piece of data that we've derived from our resource adequacy study. Um, and I think uh, different people might have different thoughts on which of these uh, is the most informative or which one best explains to them what the actual risk facing the system is. Um, and thinking through how we communicate these types of technical uh, findings or insights uh, to a wider range of audiences is something that as an industry, we're gonna have to think about uh, more moving forward. So with that, I'll pass over to the next speaker. Uh, I know these ideas have all been kind of uh, abstract and, and uh, not really tangible, but I think the, the next speakers are going to provide some more concrete examples that uh, hopefully will will build on some of these ideas and uh, and bring them kind of down to earth with uh, specific systems that we care about. So thanks very much. Thank you, Gord. Really appreciate that presentation. Um, I believe next up we have Elaine Hart. Hi there. Can you hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you just finally. Okay, share my screen here. How does that look? That looks great. Great. All right, well, thank you. Uh, my name is Elaine Hart. I'm an independent consultant based in Portland, Oregon. And uh, I'm gonna be walking through a, a case study of the Western US where we've sort of tried to use some of these um, more modern RA metrics uh, to illuminate sort of information about how you should really plan to achieve resource adequacy in these systems. I think I really appreciated Gord's comments about sort of the intuitiveness of, of a lot of these metrics. Ultimately, we're doing these analyses to inform planning decisions. Um, and so we're gonna try to show how you might connect some of those dots um, using this example. Uh, this, this project that I'm presenting on um, is sponsored by Grid Lab. Uh, and in this project, we developed an open source and publicly available toolkit um, to perform RA analysis in the Western United States. It's based on a, a open source um, platform called GridPath that does production cost modeling, capacity expansion, all that. And now we've sort of um, tweaked it a little bit to do RA analysis for us as well. Uh, in this study, we're really focused on innovating in a couple of areas, transmission flows and regional coordination in particular, uh, capturing weather correlations um, across the entire West uh, in a manner that respects sort of the, the physics of, of um, of weather phenomena across a very large area, considering the dynamic dispatch of energy limited resources, including storage and hydro, and digging a little bit into how temperature affects the capacities of, of thermal resources across the West as well. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on our base scenario, which looks at the year 2026 
under the assumption that all sort of planned retirements occur, but none of the planned additions occur. So this is, it's almost a no action scenario or a limited action where the only actions that we're taking between now and 2026 are retiring things. And then I'm gonna show another scenario at the very end, just to, to delve into another topic um, uh, in addition to metrics. So when we run this, when we run this case, you know, we, we can get a whole bunch of different RA metrics uh, and I've shown a few of them here. You've, sort of been introduced to a lot of these metrics today already. The LOLP year, this is that loss of load probability that the Power Council has traditionally relied upon. In this system, we get a 52% LOP, so it doesn't achieve a 5% LOP. It appears inadequate with respect to that metric. Calculate a loss of load expectation. It's We um, have an LOLE of 13.7 days every 10 years, so it, doesn't, it also doesn't achieve a one day and 10 year standard. Um, and we see that we expect 3.03 hours per year of loss of load, so it doesn't achieve that 2.4 hour per year LLH standard that some um, entities have adopted as well. So we can kind of use these high level metrics. You can see here we've also reported expected unserved energy and that normalized um, expected unserved energy as well. You can use these high level metrics to some of them at least to kind of get a sense that, okay, this system isn't really adequate, um, but these metrics alone don't tell you what to do about that. Uh, and we really care about, you know, okay, how do we get to adequacy? And I, I just want to highlight here first, also this, whether or not the system is adequate and what it takes to make a system adequate completely depends on the RA standard that you choose to adopt. So I've shown the three RA standards here that we look into in the study, the 5% LLP, one day in 10 years and 2.4 hours per year. These standards have different stringency and they're focused on different types of risk. Uh, for this particular system, the 5% LLP is the most stringent. Um, and in order to achieve that standard for this system, it appears that you need um, about eight and a half gigawatts of capacity across the West uh, by 2026. Uh, to achieve a one day and 10 year standard, it comes down a little bit, 7.7 .7 gigawatts. Uh, and if you adopt a 2.4 hour per year standard, it's, it's much less stringent than a one day and 10 year standard because these events tend to be pretty short. Um, an outage is not an, a, an outage on one day is not a 24 hour outage. Uh, so having 2.4 hours per year allows you a few more events um, than a one day and 10 year standard. Using that standard, the system looks almost adequate. I mean, that's probably within the noise for a system as, as large as the Western United States. And so the resource needs that we identify that we choose to address um, is based on sort of the subjective call of how much risk we wanna um, uh, subject ourselves to in the system. And all of these standards can give you different results. But these, uh, these perfect capacity needs don't really tell you what, what types of resources you actually uh, might need or what types of problems you might face. And so for that, we dig in a little bit deeper and we like to describe these events in a few different ways, um, similar to how um, Gord was describing some of the newer RA metrics. So here are a couple of examples. On the left, this is a heat map that shows the loss of load hours per year as a function of the month and the hour in which they're observed. And from this, it's really clear that you can see that we're, we're looking at a fairly limited problem. It's limited to hot summer evenings. Um, and if you look at the right, uh, this shows the events um, broken out by their duration. All of the events that we observe in this simulation are less than eight hours, and the majority of them, the vast majority, are four hours or less. And so if you look at the timing of these events and the duration of these events, you can see this, this problem, this RA challenge, is actually pretty well suited to uh, things like energy storage or flexible load, especially if they're paired with solar, um, things that can just ride you through those few hours as the, as the solar as the sun is setting um, to get you through to, to the cooler hours in the evening. Another way of trying to figure out how to address uh, these RA challenges is to characterize the events based on the capacity and the energy shortages that you actually observe during each of the events. So this is a two-dimensional histogram of all of the events that we simulated in this case. Uh, across the top here, you see the maximum shortage experience during the event. So this is something like the capacity need that you'd um, that you need to eliminate the event. And, um, and vertically there, you see the total shortage, the megawatt hours of the energy of shortage that was experienced for each event. And the numbers in each of these squares is how frequently you expect to encounter uh, an event of that type uh, in, in a 10 year simulation or in, in sorry, in, in 10 years. And so you would wanna design solutions that basically eliminate a portion of these events and get you down to, well, in the example I'm gonna show you, um, only one 
event every 10 years. So here's one way of designing a solution. You could just draw a simple vertical line. Uh, this is a perfect capacity solution. This one provides 8,000 megawatts in, in every hour, and it eliminates all the events to the left of it, and it leaves only those events to the right. And that achieves a uh, one day and 10 year standard. But you can see that by trying to eliminate these events using perfect capacity, you're also eliminating a whole bunch of events that we don't expect to happen, these sort of higher energy, longer duration events in the, the bottom quadrant here of this heat map. A smarter way, a more efficient way to avoid uh, or to meet the standard might be to instead draw a rectangle here where you're providing the system with a certain amount of capacity and a certain amount of energy, you're still, and you're still able to meet the one day and 10 year standard. Now you can actually draw a whole bunch of different rectangles um, on this graph and meet the one day uh, and 10 year standard in different ways, different combinations of energy and capacity. And if you do that, you can end up with sort of an efficient frontier of capacity solutions um, to meet your standard. So this graph shows you for various durations of capacity solutions, uh, how much of that capacity you would need in order to achieve the standard. And this is basically just drawing all those different rectangles that you, that, that you could from the, the prior graph. As you go to the, to the very right, uh, set that out, send that out to infinity, you get perfect capacity. Um, and you see that 7,700 uh, megawatt per perfect capacity need. And then as you march to the left, you're basically constraining those resources to be available for fewer and fewer hours. And you're seeing what does that mean for the amount of capacity that you would need. Now this system, because the shortages are really pretty short in duration, you can march all the way down to four hours of um, uh, four hours of capacity and not not actually need any more megawatts of it. So the four hour capacity need for this system is the same as the perfect capacity need. That means, uh, you know, if I could build a, a perfect resource that's available, but but it's only available for four hours uh, at a time, uh, that would meet the same. Uh, need here as a baseload resource that's available in all years, uh, all hours of the year. Now, if you further constrain the, the system, whether it's like a really short duration, uh, like load flexibility program that's only available for like two hours or something, then you start to need more and more capacity of that. And the cost optimal point uh, along this curve will, will depend on the cost of, of all the resource options that you have to meet this need. But we can kind of just see using our using our eyes here that it's unlikely here that it's worth spending much money to go beyond a three or four hour solution for this particular case. And I will say that uh, the solution duration here is not this is not necessarily a four hour battery because uh, you have to charge four hour batteries and uh, this doesn't account this analysis doesn't account for the charging. But anecdotally, when you do throw a four hour battery into this system, there is enough extra generation to charge it. And so four hour batteries in this system turn out to be a really great solution. All right, next I wanna talk about one of the other scenarios um, that we looked at in the study. This is a scenario where, as I mentioned in this, the last scenario, there was no action through 2026. It basically assumes that utilities don't come through with their current plans. There's no incremental procurement or um, build unless it was under construction already about, about a year ago. Um, that's an interesting base case, but it's not a likely case because there are a lot of plans already in the works. And so this, in this scenario, um, we incorporate just those planned resources coming out of California. Uh, so this incorporates the CPUC preferred system plan, um, which includes 28 gigawatts of clean energy in California. I'll say when we just throw that in, the system's, the whole West looks adequate. And so to make it more interesting, we retired an additional uh, 11 gigawatts of coal elsewhere in the West as it would happen. And this is a system where it's actually pretty close to, to adequate. It's about 2000 megawatts of need, perfect capacity need to meet the one day and 10 year standard. If you were to adopt a 2.4 hour per year standard, that less stringent standard in this case, it would, it would appear adequate. Um, but I, I introduced this scenario to look at a sub-regional case. Um, so what we've done here is we've actually broken that footprint into a couple of different areas. And what I'm showing you here are the results of a, a RAP-like footprint. So this is the Western Resource Adequacy Program. Our model uses all publicly available data. And so we're not able to exactly map 
uh, the, the wrap footprint, but this is a physical representation of BA, most of the BAs um, uh, where there are LSCs that are, are have indicated interest in, in joining wrap. And I show it in two different ways, one in an islanded case um, and one where we allow wrap to see the, you know, the excess generation, available generation in the rest of the West when they're constrained. So this is a with imports case. And I bring this up to show, I bring this up to, to say that, you know, choosing an RA standard and choosing RA metrics, these are subjective policy decisions based on, um, you know, risk tolerance. But there are other decisions that need to be made in RA analysis and in planning that are somewhat subjective and also can have really big implications for the, the, the plans and the resources that we add to the system to try to achieve adequacy. And in this particular case, I'm, I'm highlighting the importance of import assumptions, and this came up earlier uh, earlier as well during Wex presentation. If you treat this footprint as islanded, you can't see California effectively, it looks like we have a very infrequent but long duration winter problem and a pretty large magnitude and long duration summer problem. If you're able to see what's going on in the rest of the West and account for excess generation when it's available, almost all of those problems go away and you end up with a, a system that's that's nearly adequate there's still about two gigawatts of perfect capacity need and so i just bring this up to highlight that there are a lot of subject subjective decisions um in ra analysis and in ra planning and uh and uh some of them including imports are going to be critically important for determining what type of infrastructure uh, we add to the system the resources that you would uh, acquire to solve the problems on the left here are very different from the resources that you would acquire to solve the problems on the right. And with that, I'll hand it over to uh, the next panelist. Thanks so much, Elaine. Those are really interesting examples. And I think um, is a great segue for our next panel after the break, which will be talking about the Western Resource Advocacy Program. But now I will turn it over to JP for our next presentation. All right, thanks, Nora, and thanks, everyone, um, for attending. I'm uh, very excited to be here. Let me share my screen. And swap here and display. You see my full screen now? Perfect. All right, so um, I'm going to present a um, slice of recent work that we have not yet published at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Um, this is in collaboration with Nan Sang and uh, Ben Leibowitz at UT Austin, and this is a broader project that also includes um, staff from Weeb. Um, let me kind of introduce that uh, general um, uh, project first, just to give you a flavor of what we're up to, and then I'll, I'll go into this slides that pertains to uh, resource adequacy metrics that I chose for this particular presentation. Um, we're taking a, a broader, perhaps, um, step back in terms of uh, revising resource adequacy uh, assessments. Uh, most of what we have been hearing today is about assessing resource adequacy of systems, but we are trying to fit that uh, process within a broader set of uh, components that um, that include the definition of resource adequacy and for example, into what extent we should include resilience and, and how if we, we did. Uh, it, it of course includes targets and tracking metrics. Um, sometimes it, there, there it is, uh, we use them interchangeably. Um, the, the metrics we use to target resource adequacy and the metrics we use to track it, but they could be indeed different and we um, speak to that. We delve into methods and models and the data needs, um, which have been you know, most of the, uh, the core of the work in the last few years on resource adequacy, but then we take this into how those, these three different components lead to resource procurement decisions in different jurisdiction types, uh, especially vertically integrated versus capacity market settings. And then we offer a, a retrospective evaluation um, approach where we say, well, we should find a way to under identify how these resources that we're putting on the ground are really performing from a resource adequacy perspective. And so we lay out a few ways in which that can occur. Um, for, as I mentioned, for this particular work, we did, um, we did some study, uh, some specific, more technical study um, that was focused on um, high, higher fidelity models and how, how much does it matter, the, the kind of details that we inc incorporate in models. And um, what we have established so far, uh, and I think uh, the other presenters have established as well, is that 
um, the best practice right now uh, is to present to represent the system through an hourly chronological availability of resources that really captures you know, every hour of the year and potential shortfalls at that level. Um, but the reality is that uh, in the real times, the state of a system is contingent on a number of dispatch decisions that really obey economic and technical criteria. So our question was, how does the operational characterization of a power system uh, affects the accurate computation of resource adequacy metrics in probabilistic resource adequacy assessments. Um, for this, we develop our own uh, our own little model. It's relatively simplified, but we took a, a slightly different approach in, in that we took a, a production cost model that exists. This is a Prescient model developed by Sandy National Labs, and we stripped it down to make it um, uh, tractable enough for a research adequacy assessment that is a Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, I won't go into details of how or what, what, how we set up the model. I'll just say that it's it's based on the IEEE RTS reliability test system uh, developed by Barrow um, and others in 2019, which is based in the southwestern US. And we simplified some of the input data to make our work tractable, and we also removed a number of resources to make it relatively inadequate so we could see actual results um, in our in our work um, and the, the gist of what we're trying to do here is not really uh, um, assess whether the system is adequate or not what we're trying to get at is establishing different specifications on how we do resource adequacy assessment and what kinds of details we build into a model. And as we remove a detail or change something, we want to understand how that affects what we're measuring. This is a way for us to understand how much it matters to have certain types of characteristics and features representing the models and, and how, which ones do not. So in terms of the relevance of operational considerations in RA, we did three specific analysis that are in the report. Uh, we um, analyzed how, how using economic dispatch uh, versus a non-economic dispatch strategy changes uh, the way the results of resource adequacy. Um, we also analyze different types of power dispatch strategies that could affect specially focused on storage. And, and then finally, we do analyze uh, how specific choices of uh, modeling uh, could change the uh, resource adequacy assessment and how are these changes captured or not by traditional and alternative metrics. And this is what I'm going to spend in the next couple of slides um, talking about. So um, we developed four scenarios to um, understand three specific, uh, uh, the, the impact of three specific modeling choices that we chose some, somehow, um, not randomly, but really were, there were choices that were readily available given the setup of our model. Uh, the first one, we have, um, we, we assume in all, all, most of our analysis assumes that the, there is a short-term forecast error build. So for between the day ahead and the real-time dispatch of resources, there is some error. And we try to track how much an error may affect, um, you know, meeting resource adequacy in real time. Uh, in one of the scenarios here, the second PFSF scenario, we are excluding that. We're uh, offering the model to have perfect foresight. The second uh, variable that we change is a thermal outage assumption. So we have a default assumption in terms of uh, there is a traditional way to assume uh, force outages. Um, and in our variant here, we are uh, analyzing a, an, an outage assumption that models uh, lower failure rates, but longer reservation rates. So essentially, um, we would expect the, that particular scenario to produce um, a reduced frequency in shortfalls, but perhaps a longer uh, a longer duration for false or a longer, uh, a larger amount of energy not served. And then the final one deals with transmission limit constraints. So we are using transmission limits and we are enforcing them across all our scenarios and across those 23 zones that you saw in our model. But we simulate one case where we exclude the transmission constraint and we let the model just not respect any transmission constraints and, and figure out uh, and, and determine resource adequacy in that context. And we chose that particular one because there is still many resource adequacy assessments out there that do not consider explicitly transmission constraints. And they essentially do a copper plate analysis, bringing all the resources on a single node. And so we want to understand, well, how much are these folks missing when doing that? So we do this, um, we run these scenarios and we assess their impacts using our traditional uh, metrics, the loss of load expectation in days per year, the loss of load probability and expected unserved energy. And what we find is that 
Um, first, we found that the short-term forecast had really no impact. So the fact that the system may have perfect foresight or not did not affect. We believe that's something that's an artifact in our model. So we don't focus on that scenario as much. But in the other two cases, we do see um, a reduction in, uh, assuming that the uh, first scenario here is our reference to so our benchmark that has all the characteristics built in. When we simulate an alternate uh, dispatch for or an alternate thermal outage um, regime, we, as expected, we get a lower amount of um, um, days per year because the frequencies are reduced and in, indeed the loss of low probability shrinks substantially. But the end of expected on reserve energy actually reduces, it decreases very little. And the same happens with the um, with ignoring transmission limits, um, the the loss of load expectation and probabilities are are reduced compared to the reference scenario uh, in a larger amount than the uh, ex uh, expected conserved energy. So, we'll, we're, our question is: Well, how how what, what is um, really what is really the right metric here then to assess whether these uh, two changes to sensitivities are really affecting our final results or not? It seems that from a from an energy perspective or a magnitude of the shortfall, it's not too bad, but we are missing a lot in terms of loss of load probability and loss of load um, expectations. So we used and leveled uh, leveraged uh, alternative metrics that were developed by the uh, by the council in, 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 a, in a report in a 2018 paper. And these include um, reporting the maximum shortfall magnitude and the average shortfall magnitude, both in energy and capacity. And this is where things get interesting. Um, depending on the modeling uh, characteristic that we, that we choose, some of these metrics still reflect decently, really well, um, the uh, state of resource adequacy of the system as uh, in res with respect to a reference. For example, the maximum shortfall magnitude uh, is the same in the uh, reference scenario to the left and all the way to the right in the transmission limit scenario. So ignoring transmission limits still allows you to reflect the ad and adequately the maximum shortfall magnitude. It does not allow you to reflect the average shortfall magnitude because it turns out that ignoring transmission limits um, hides, quote unquote, a number of shortfall events that, that appear when transmission limits are considered, but they're ignored when they're not. And so on average, the system, uh, the system seems to be um, having larger, um, larger shortfall magnitudes in energy and the same with, with capacity. So where does this um, leave us? Um, so, and this is a work in progress. And uh, what we're finding is that increasing the model fidelity to reflect operational reality may not necessarily translate to improve a resource adequacy assessment, or at the very least requires a careful choice of the metrics to assess the impact. So this means that some of the um, entities out there that are using relatively simplified models uh, may still be getting resource assessment correctly, depending on the metrics they choose. Conversely, uh, some of the uh, some of these entities may, depending on the metrics they use, may may be sub um, subestimating the uh, uh, or overestimating the resource adequacy of their systems. And I wanted to wrap up here, offering a few questions that could be you know fodder for our discussion later. Um, for example, one of them is how do we strengthen the ability of the metrics used for uh, resource adequacy assessments to inform the timing, location, and technology of new resources? Right now, we really rely on the planning reserve margin, and we do all this fabulous exercise, and we translate everything to a planning reserve margin, and then we try to we use a number of um, sort of um, uh, approaches to, to say, how do we meet that planning reserve margin? But perhaps there's better ways to take advantage of these detailed models that we're producing. Um, what processes can be implemented to empirically validate these uh, different metrics and, and whether when we put a steel on the ground, whether the metrics that we can, uh, what metrics can we use and processes can we use to identify uh, the impact on resource adequacy. And finally, how do our metrics depend on the way short and long duration storage is modeled? We did a little bit of work here in this paper on short duration storage, uh, but the, we, we have not been able to tackle long duration and I, we believe it, it seems to is going to have a, a big impact. And so we want to understand how resource adequacy metrics may reflect the contributions of these two types of resources. Thank you very much. Thank you, JP, for that great presentation. I really appreciate you illustrating how important it is to keep in mind that assumptions and models will, of course, influence um, the outputs that we're seeing when it comes to resource adequacy. So we'll turn to Nick for our final presentation on this panel, um, and then we'll open it up for questions and dialogue among the presenters. 
Okay, uh, let me pull up my slides while I'm doing that. How's my audio? Is it coming through? You sound great. Great, thank you. Okay. Uh, well, hey everyone, my name is Nick Schlag. I'm a partner with the consulting firm E3 uh, based in San Francisco. Really happy to be here. Resource adequacy has become one of my favorite topics to work on over the past five or so years. Uh, we as a company have done work on resource adequacy in all corners of the Western interconnection at this point. And in many, in many instances, it's been in the context of an imperative or a goal to transition the energy system to a decarbonized portfolio of resources. Um, and so I'm excited to bring some thoughts from that work to you guys. Uh, this presentation isn't particularly related to any specific one of those efforts or projects, but it's more so some general observations uh, that we've come to through a lot of the work that we've done. So I appreciated how the folks from WEC this morning introduced two different ways of thinking about resource adequacy one through a capacity accounting construct, and then a second using probabilistic modeling techniques to express the risk of loss of load events. Uh, a lot of our panel so far has focused on resource adequacy metrics that you might think of as event-based metrics in that they describe the frequency, the magnitude, and the duration of potential loss of load events. I'm gonna spend my time talking about metrics for capacity accreditation and how we can continue to look at resource adequacy through a lens where we can stack up megawatts of capacity against a requirement, even as the system comes to rely on a more and more complex mix of resources and the risks begin to shift outside of what you think of as the traditional peak period. Now, I don't look at these two categories of metrics as really an either or decision. We view these event-based metrics as really complementary to a capacity accounting construct. And so I hope you can kind of think of this presentation as complementary to what you've heard from some of the other panelists this morning. So done properly, these two different ways of looking at resource adequacy are, are actually much more closely related than it might at first seem. And that's because the probabilistic models that we use to calculate the event-based metrics that you've heard about from the other panelists are actually the same exact tools that we should be using to calculate capacity credits for each resource. These types of models that we call loss of load probability models are really the industry's gold standard for examining resource adequacy. And what we can do is we can use this type of model not only to calculate those event-based metrics that you've heard about, but we can also use those, those models to conduct an ELCC or effective load carrying capability assessment that allows us to calculate a capacity credit for each resource that's directly linked to what you see it can do in that detailed statistical model in such a way that we can take every resource on the system and stack them up megawatt by megawatt and compare them against a requirement in a manner that's adaptive and robust even as technology evolves and the resource mix changes. And what we see is that this type of an ELCC approach is a considerable improvement over many of the shortcuts and heuristics that have been used to count capacity in the past. So what is effective load carrying capability? I'm sure many people have heard of this term and have some basic familiarity with it, but, and so I'll try to be brief here, but in simplistic terms, it's a way of expressing a resources contribution to system reliability measured as a percentage relative to a hypothetical perfect resource. So if a resource did have a 100% ELCC that means it would provide the same contribution to resource adequacy as a resource that would be available at full capacity throughout the entire year. A resource that has a 50% ELCC provides effectively half the capacity value of that perfect resource. And so in this respect, you can think of ELCC as a sort of exchange rate that allows us to measure the relative capacity value of each different type of resource on an apples to apples and technology agnostic basis accounting for system dynamics across the entire year, and also accounting for the unique limitations and constraints on each resource's dispatch or utilization. So for these reasons, we're quickly becoming, we're quickly seeing ELCC become the preferred capacity accreditation technique or metric within the industry. And it's really gaining widespread traction and utilization, especially among utilities in the West. Oops, I'm sorry about that. Um, so 
I wanted to give a couple kind of cartoon examples to illustrate the power of this type of ELCC accounting and some of the dynamics that you're able to pick up when you use this type of a technique. So one way to think about ELCC is that it measures how well a resource's availability aligns with the periods in which the grid is under the greatest strain or stress due to resource constraints. And this is an important concept because I think there's generally an appreciation that the times of greatest risk will begin to move around as a function of the resource mix on the system. So what this allows ELCC to capture is dynamics like the fact that variable resources will exhibit a declining marginal capacity value as the net peak shifts to periods where those resources are no longer available. So I illustrate this dynamic on the far left here with solar in a summer peaking system where as you add more solar and the net peak shifts into the evening, you get less and less value out of your solar resource. But the same thing is in many ways true of a system with high penetrations of wind, where the more wind you have, the greater your risk of loss of load may be driven by the occurrence of low wind production events. Energy storage resources can actually also exhibit this declining marginal capacity value that would be picked up by ELCC. And you can kind of think of this in the same manner, namely, as you get more and more storage on your system, your loss of road load risk becomes more and more. And as that period becomes longer and longer, resources with a fixed or limited duration provide less and less capacity value. The final dynamic that becomes really important and interesting is what you see on the far right especially in the transition to a clean portfolio. And it's the notion that interactive effects between technologies become really important. So the example I show here is if you actually take that same solar and storage and stick it together on the same system, you actually get a total capacity value that's greater than the sum of the individual parts. And so this is really a crucial sort of aspect of an ELCC approach is that you can pick up that sort of synergistic value between combinations of resources. Now, there are a lot of other types of interactive effects and sort of diversity benefits that you can think of as being picked up in an ELCC methodology. Certainly won't go through all of these, but hydro and its interactions with different resources will certainly be crucial to, to think about and capture in the Northwest. In particular, we see the potential for a strong synergistic or positive relationship between renewables and hydro, where renewable energy can allow you to store water behind the dam for the periods where you need it most. But then there's also potentially what we might think of as a negative or antagonistic pairing between storage and hydro, where in a system with you know, a lot of existing latent storage capability with the hydro system, new investments in energy storage might actually produce less value than they would in another system. So this is my last slide and it's a, it's a crucial one. I think many people have gotten familiar and comfortable with the idea that ELCC can be applied to wind and solar resources. And we see that uh, in many places throughout the country at this point. We're also seeing many people start to consider applying these same techniques to energy storage as well. But the reality is that there is no resource that's truly perfect in its availability. And really the most powerful application of the ELCC concept is one that applies the same technique to analyze all resources where every resource on the system would be given a haircut based on its respective limitations and capabilities. And if we can get to that point, that gives us sort of the most technology agnostic, efficient framework to credit resources, to maintain reliability, and to send the efficient signals for investment in the types of resources that we need as we transition towards a cleaner and cleaner portfolio. So well, in there, hopefully we have a little bit of time for questions and discussion. Thanks very much, Nick. That was really helpful and appreciate you um, getting into capacity credit um, accreditation issues. I wanted to invite all four of, of our panelists to come back on video if you would like to do so. Um, and we'll try to have a little discussion among the panelists um, and answer a few questions that have come up. One thing I wanted to ask you all is that I thought Elaine's presentation did a really good job of demonstrating that ultimately when it comes to resource adequacy assessments, there's an inherent policy choice in terms of how much and what type of risk are we allowed, are we willing to tolerate? Um, and I wanted to return on that note to what Gord raised about how do we make RA more metrics more accessible um, so that policymakers have a better understanding of what are the trade-offs, what choices need to be made? Um, and I wanted everyone's on this panel's input on, do you have ideas about 
how to make these metrics more understandable, more accessible. Um, for example, I really appreciated that you all used graphs to kind of show what are the trade-offs um, between different scenarios that might have the same value output. Uh, but any ideas on how to make RA metrics more accessible and understandable to folks who may not be as steeped into the methodology issues? I guess I can I can jump in and say some things while other folks think about this one. But I, I guess I, I would I, I don't have a specific proposal here, but I think that it would be helpful to have metrics that help us think about the these shortages in terms of their impacts on actual customers. So for example, if you were to face one of these shortages um, using, you know, and, and maintain reliability on the grid through rolling brownouts, how many customers customers would be affected and for how long would they be affected? I think that'd be a, a really helpful way to translate so, some of this into something more tangible for policymakers. And, you know, and some of these, I, I think it would also help us understand sort of how stringent are these reliability metrics really when, when you think about their impacts on people. A type of event where a customer experiences an outage for a couple of hours um, once every year or two, that's, that's not too bad for folks who are used to experiencing power outages all the time due to other types of failures on the system. And so th those types of sort of human translations of all this, I think can help us make better decisions about how much to invest in avoiding this one specific type of failure. I can, I can jump in and uh, perhaps add that I, I think it would, it would help if we were able to link more strongly the metrics with their cost uh, implications, both on how much does it cost to achieve a certain metric target, and ideally trying to incorporate some aspect of the value of those load, essentially how much does it cost to not meet certain cer certain targets, and, and try to put that in a balance. Right now, these metrics are standards that are almost pulled out of thin air, and they have been there for a long time. And we really, I think we really need to do a better job at, at connecting those to the costs, especially as we electrify and decarbonize and use this. And it's going to, the cost for a user of not having power is gonna to have to increase. It's, it's almost almost a, a one direction. And so does it mean, does that mean that we need to start putting our research setup with the standards need to be more stringent? And if so, how much do I need to increase a standard and, and for, or for how much to meet that potential new uh, you know, cost of, of my customers losing load. And I think as Elaine says, uh, depending on who's affected, their cost of losing, not having load will change quite dramatically. So creating that connection down to the customer would allow uh, for choices that are uh, perhaps at the bulk power system scale will be harder to make. But when you start looking down at choices that are more regional, uh, it will start creating that link more strongly. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll add in a quick thought here. First, I liked I liked Elaine's thought about putting more of a human perspective on on metrics that can sometimes seem numerically a little bit abstract. The other thing that I think can make things a little bit more concrete. I'm more of a visual guy than I am a numbers guy, and especially when we're talking about you know the same frequency of metrics but much different sizes or different lengths. I've always found it helpful to actually have you know pictures of what or graphs of what's actually happening in the electricity system so that you could see, you know, what fraction of my load am I not able to serve and for how long and start to distinguish visually between, you know, an event that might just be a sliver of your load being shed versus, you know, a big fraction of your system not able to serve itself. So that's, that's maybe not a different type of metric, but just thinking about different ways to take that same underlying data and, and convey it in a way that's more accessible for certain folks. We raised this issue in the paper that I mentioned before, but we also didn't really claim to have a great solution. <laughs> I think uh, it's a tough problem. It's a very specific problem to the particular context you're working in. Different stakeholders obviously care about different things, have different priorities. Different types of energy users may have different preferences about what a disruption looks like to them. Um, in terms of whether they'd have rather have something that's short but happens multiple times or just one long big one. Um, obviously, you can design a system that's more likely to enter one of those different outcomes, but uh, 
communicating that and then also translating that to kind of social welfare and, and, and preferences that are inherently heterogeneous, you know, with lots of different consumers with lots of different needs um, is a very kind of specific and hard to generalize uh, task. Thank you all for those responses. That's really helpful. Um, lots more to think about here. I'm gonna quickly try to get to two questions. We'll cut a little bit into our break, but um, I think a couple of good questions have come up. One from Renewable Northwest, um, which came through in the chat. It's a question about how do you correlate thermal outages with temperature in this model? Um, Nick, I think that's a presentation that or may have come up in your presentation. Um, this individual noted that previous events over the past few years have shown assuming a fixed thermal outage, usually around 5%, does not currently work. Do you have any thoughts about that, Nick? Or if others would like to comment, um, I'd welcome that as well. Yeah, I'm sure others will have thoughts on this one as well, because it certainly relates to the underlying simulation techniques, uh, not only to the sort of ELCC kind of construct that, that I've spoken about. Um, but from my perspective, I think this is a really important area of emerging research. Uh, a number of the events and close calls that we've seen in the past few years, obviously the most striking of which was probably the winter storm Uri in, in Texas, have really made it resonate with folks that there are these sort of correlates. Well, so I think it's it's wise for all of us as model practitioners to have our, our minds focused on this and to take a much closer look at the assumptions built into the simulations on that topic. A lot of my, a lot of the really interesting work that's happened in this space um, in recent years, uh, some of those folks have ended up becoming my colleagues at NREL. Uh, so I have some, uh, I have some uh, kind of lucky enough to have some contacts who are thinking about that uh, at the lab. Um, I, I'll drop in a link to a paper that that discusses these issues in case other people are interested. Um, and I know not everyone has access to academic journals, so you can also reach out to me if if you want more information on that. Um, I think the, there's a short answer and a long answer. The short answer is we can model that. Like the, the models we use have the capability to capture those types of dynamics. Uh, the harder part is actually the data. Um, so like NERC, for example, has its GADS data sets that it releases, which are kind of long run average outage rates for units. Um, and obviously because those are kind of long run and not kind of granular time data, you can't uh, with those averages draw conclusions about sensitivity to, to temperature changes and things. Uh, if you have access to the underlying data that gets actually reported by the generators, um, you can draw uh, some, some conclusions and, and work on those trends. Uh, and that's the type of work that, that some of my colleagues have, have been able to do. Um, but getting that data and the confidentiality issues around that um, gets complicated. And uh, so I think as an industry, one thing that we could do to improve on this is figure out a way to uh, maybe be reporting some kind of average, you know, obviously this varies not just by technology type, but by region. So uh, a coal plant in Minnesota is probably better winterized than a coal plant in Florida. And uh, there's going to be variations in the sensitivities to temperatures and things like that. Um, and right now we don't, there's not a lot of publicly available data to um, capture that, to allow people to include that in models. Um, but from a modeling perspective, the good news is that's not too complicated to, to capture once we have the data to describe it. But the data is, the, I think, currently the challenge that we need to work on. Thanks so much, Gordon, Nick. Um, really appreciate that. I did just really quickly want to give James Adcock an opportunity to unmute himself if you would like. James, I know you had your hand up and you had a couple comments um, in the chat about um, using hydro as a storage um, resource. So I want to give you an opportunity. Hopefully we can keep this discussion short so we don't cut into our break too much, but James, okay. I'll pass it to you. Uh, well, very shortly, there's two sides to the table um, and we're hearing entirely from one side um, on this stuff. Um, clearly, <clears throat> industry wants to build more natural gas speakers and when they do that and when they argue for that, that works against our goals under CETA. Uh, so I want to make sure the modeling is done fairly and the discussion is handled fairly. And from my perspective, that's not happening. Um, I believe there's tremendous ability to store energy, such as from wind and solar in our, in our hydro system. As Fazio points out, there are limits on that. I don't know that the limits have really been explored fairly. Um, 
And I think ultimately, as I would certainly agree, as we move forward with more wind and more solar, that's going to make hydro operators more unhappy. And that's something we need to address as a system. I think you've got to look at external realities. Uh, when mid-sea market is extremely high, that that is talking about resource limitations. When the mid-sea markets are very low, that's record resource adequacy. And when um, Washington State or the, the Northwest region is exporting eight gigawatts to California, that's resource adequacy. And when California is extremely rarely importing, uh, uh, allowing maybe one gig to flow from California up to Washington State, that is perhaps talking to resource inadequacy in that region. But, you know, we 24-7, 365, almost, we're sending eight gigawatts down to California. So I think you really got to look at both sides of the equation in terms of whether we are adequate or not, and, and not just listen to the modelers. Thank you. Thanks for that question, James, um, that comment. I, I really want to emphasize we're grateful to have this panel here because I think they're really emphasizing the need for complexity and looking at different scenarios in our modeling. Um, I know one of our panelists talked about different, you know, uh, models of the system in terms of economic dispatch and et cetera. Um, and I think this panel is, is really great for showing we need to do various approaches to modeling and looking at different iterations. Um, I, 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 I want to acknowledge that E3 comes closer to my position than, than what I've heard from other people. Thank you. Thanks, James. Um, does anyone on the panel want to have a, a last opportunity to comment at all? We're really grateful for all of your time and the opportunity for to learn from you as kind of cutting edge experts in this space. Um, so any any last thoughts from all of you before we wrap for the break? All right, well, we'll go ahead and close it out there. Um, we're gonna try to be back around 1130 for our next panel. So sorry to cut into everyone's break a little bit, but um, really wanted to take advantage of having these folks on the call today to have a little bit of a dialogue. Thank you all again for joining us and we'll be back at 1130.
Hi, everyone. We'll be getting started in just about a minute. Hi, everyone. Welcome back from our break. Sorry that we had a bit of an abbreviated break. A lot of great content to get through this morning. Um, sorry, we haven't been able to get to all of your questions, but hopefully we'll have some additional time this afternoon. Um, we have one more panel before the lunch break. We'll be breaking around 1215 for an hour long lunch coming back at 115. Next, we're excited that we'll be hearing from the Western Power Pool about the Emerging Resource Adequacy Program. Um, we're delighted to have Sarah Edmonds and Ryan Roy here to present. So Sarah, I'll pass it to you. All right, thank you. Um, just sound check, can you hear me okay, Nora? Okay, great. All right, thanks so much for having Ryan and I here today. We're gonna tag team through this presentation. Our intent today, if we can go to the second slide, Ryan, is to give you a high level overview of where we're at with the Western Resource Adequacy Program, including some elements of governance, how the forward showing component of our program works, what we're envisioning for the operations program component, and then some important updates on our design and our timeline. The thing I wanna emphasize here is that Western Resource Adequacy Program or RAP as we'll refer to it throughout our presentation, is a first of its kind uh, compliance planning and compliance framework um, that takes a west-wide approach to the issue of resource adequacy. Perfect. So this map shows what our current wrap footprint looks like in the darker blue color. This effort started a few years ago at the behest of industry that asked the Western Power Pool, which was then named the Northwest Power Pool, to undertake what it would what it would entail to set up a voluntary to join, but once you're in, you are subject to the RA compliance requirements of the program. What would it take to set up a program like that that would use the diversity of our footprint to achieve some really first of its kind looks for the region in terms of resource adequacy and also an operational framework that would actually let us access some of the diversity of our system in terms of loads, resources, and transmission. This slide shows you on the left who the current participants are in the program. This program is focused on what we call load responsible entities, um, those entities that serve load. It is not taking a balancing authority area approach which is an important point of clarification and a difference from some of the other incremental efforts in the West to integrate the grid. So we're focused on load responsible entities or load serving entities, voluntary framework, but once you're in, there are mandatory requirements for the period of the RA framework. Um, we decided a long time ago as an industry that we didn't want to wait for a day ahead and real time market solution to, to come to the West to address the issue of resource adequacy. That the issue of RA was so clear, so clear of a need for the region that we were gonna go ahead and launch this program and rely on bilateral trading frameworks to access the diversity of the RA capacity pool. But we did always state that when and if market solutions came along, it would be our intent for the RAP to um, work comparably with those programs. And I can talk more about that a little later. Next slide. Uh, this is just a quick update on our timeline. There's a lot of data here, but what I wanna emphasize is that we're at the end of what we have called um, our phase 3A, which is putting together the tariff and all of the pieces that make up the binding program the binding program means that the RA requirements that we produce as part of RAP um, become real compliance requirements for the entities. Uh, this first takes effect for the summer of 2024 season. Until then, we get the benefit of going through a number of what we call non-binding seasons, which mean that we produce all of the same data. We request data and produce 
resource adequacy requirements, um, but those, it's informational. It gives uh, participants a really important opportunity to learn what their obligations are gonna look like to make adjustments to their procurement strategies to work with their regulators and any other agencies before we hit summer of 2024. Um, we're working to file this tariff with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and we hope to do so by August so that we have all of our T's and I's dotted and crossed for January of 2023, when we would go out to the participants with an agreement for the binding future seasons. Next slide. The value proposition. So Ryan's gonna talk about some of the things. We've heard a lot of information today about really innovative thoughts in the area of resource adequacy modeling. And we're following all that, but I really wanna emphasize that even though our approach is uh, to start with somewhat simplified with some innovations that we've brought to the table, we're going to deliver something that the West has not ever had before. Today, RA is done utility by utility or load serving entity by load serving entity. And as a result, they're necessarily confined by the information available to them. They'll also make various assumptions about resource capability, about market liquidity and what they can get on a short-term market basis versus longer procurement strategies. This presents the risk of potentially assuming there's more supply out there than there may actually be. And this risk is really heightened when we understand that there's multiple load serving entities making these same assumptions. So we don't really know how deep the end of the pool is. There are different views on what kind of liquidity that supply has but through our program, we bring RA planning on a footprint wide basis. And I hope you could see from our map before on the previous slide that it really is a west wide approach at this point. There will be shared RA compliance requirements. So all of these entities make commitments to each other about the resources they're going to bring to this RA capacity pool for the benefit of all. It requires necessarily that we use common assumptions for our regional RA approach. We have a common format and protocol for the data that we gather from the participants directly. It produces for the first time ever a single picture of regional need that the participants are obligated to, potentially with the ability to send much more accurate signals about the actual depth of reliable market supply, that risk I noted earlier, and what we hope will be better, more accurate signals about what new resources we need. But I really wanna emphasize that RAP is not about resource choice. That remains a matter of local control. What RAP is trying to do is bring a consistent approach for defining that regional need and for how we count resources so that everyone is on the same playing field when it comes to identifying what is our regional need what is our regional planning reserve margin? And how are we gonna count up the resources that are gonna meet those requirements? Really, this is about the diversity benefit when you bring together a footprint that wide, that diverse in terms of its operations, its resources, its geographical scope, its time zone scope, you're really bringing in diversity benefits, both on the planning horizon when we're counting up all the resources that we have and in the operations timeframe when we hope to use trading platforms to access that diversity and really help one another out, which is really the construct and the promise, the commitments that are being made as part of RAP where all the participants are making these commitments to each other. I believe next slide is you, Brian. Sure, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, Sarah noted that this is being done on an individual by individual entity basis now. We really want to help move the Western Interconnect region to those benefits that the previous presenters have been talking about as we move towards a deeply decarbonized grid. So how is it that we're going to do that? Um, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to implement a binding forward showing framework. Um, that's going to ensure or require that entities have su uh, secured sufficient capacity to meet that regional reliability metric. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the Western Interconnect, you know, absent sort of California is unique in that we are operating under a bilateral market construct. 
So how is it that we can access that diversity that we've tried to sort of bring to the table in that forward showing? Um, that's our binding operational program. Um, we're going to calculate surplus and deficit from entities and provide a way, facilitate the exchange of that diversity on the operating hour. And so, you know, the reason we're doing all of these things is because we want to establish a reasonable reliability metric uh, that is, um, you know, recognizes diversity in load and resources. Uh, we want to inform resource selection and drive that investment savings. How can we safely set a reliability metric that folks can meet collectively that is lower than what they would have uh, had to meet uh, individually? The benefit of diversity uh, in the Western interconnect that folks have been talking about. <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit about timeline here and then I'll pass it back to Sarah. So we've got the forward showing program. We established the reliability metric in a binding way two years prior to that forward showing. We also do indicative modeling that gives us indication of resource uh, accreditation and establishment of a reliability metric on a five-year basis. This helps folks uh, with those planning processes. Again, this isn't to usurp the IRP process. You know, you folks are looking five, 10, 15, 20 years out. We really want to inform that five-year sort of look ahead as a complement to your current IRP planning processes. Um, the forward showing starts seven months in advance of the operations uh, program. So you'll submit your uh, load data, resource data, and we'll go through that forward showing. Um, if you're deficient in that forward showing, there is an opportunity to uh, uh, tier, go out and procure that capacity to uh, uh, address any potential deficiency. Our operations program starts the operating day minus seven. So we start this rolling assessment of where folks uh, estimated loads and resource um, capabilities are coming in relative to that forward showing. That's going to establish some folks being surplus, other folks potentially being deficit, and gives us the information we need to um, share that diversity on the operating day. We believe this is a big enhancement, that, that discussion about how uh, tight things may be, the state of the grid, so to speak, we're moving that from, you know, sort of near real time to, you know, weeks and even in the forward showing, you know, months, potentially years ahead of where it is now, which we, which we think brings a big benefit. And then, of course, on an after the fact basis, uh, uh, we have um, settlement for these transactions. Sarah, I'll turn it over to you to talk a little bit about governance. Yeah, and right, if this, I'm going to stay on this slide, actually, and just I've got other detail in my slides about some details on governance. I thought I'd highlight some governance aspects. Today's conversation has been very technical in nature, but sort of the softer side of RAP in terms of where we have provided for voices, the ability to influence and independent decision-making is one of the real notable standouts of the early success of the RAP so far. This chart for me is the best way to look at this. It's a little bit busy, but I really want you to focus on the blue and the green, so the middle and the left side. The blue is the corporation itself, Western Power Pool, recently renamed. And the thing I'd emphasize here is that for the first time in the pool's history, with concurrent with an approved tariff to go forward with the binding wrap program, we would make a lot of revisions to way that decision-making inside of Western Power Pool is performed, including the revision of our current board to a fully independent board, independent meaning financially independent from any participant in RAP, as well as a number of other qualifications that go to the heart of making sure there's no bias in the administration of decision-making for Western Power Pool. There is also contemplated, and this is really another key feature, a multi-sector nominating committee that's brought together to help identify and select qualified members for the board of directors as we cycle through new board seats. And again, this is not inventing new wheels. The energy imbalance market has used this with great success so far, but it's an important element that allows multiple slices of sector industry to have influence in the board. There is also the RAP program itself, which is the square in green and all of the parts inside of that. And the key features there are, there is a resource adequacy participants committee, 
or RAPSI. And those were essentially, if we can get everyone we have today to move forward, it would be all of those entities that were listed on the left-hand side of my earlier slide. So we have RAPSI, it's essentially the membership committee, and they have a fair amount of influence in the organization, but there are checks and balances. And some of those checks and balances include the committee of state representatives. So a representative from every state where a participant is regulated in the RAP, that's a really key feature. It borrows on a lot of the workable constructs that we've seen for state representation from EIM, but it has some enhancements and the ability to grow and evolve. Program review committee is another really important feature, which again is sector-based. So it's pulling from multiple slices of industry. They are the committee that's primarily responsible for engaging with the public, for taking public comment, for administering suggestions for changes to the program, for essentially marshalling any idea from anyone anywhere through our governance process to determine whether or not that idea merits a change to the program. So where we can, we've really made an effort to open this up, to provide for voices, to ensure independence. It is still scaled to the fact that this is an RA program only. This is not a market. It does not have any market features, but there are some elements that put us in the land of FERC jurisdiction in terms of how we're gonna share our capacity reserves and how we have compliance penalties for failure to meet the requirements. So Ryan, I think we'll bump through a couple slides and go to you to talk about some of the technical design elements of the program. Sure, thanks, Sarah. So I mentioned before, this program is made up of a forward showing and an operations program. So I'm gonna walk through those a little bit now. I also really wanna to touch on some things that I know are important to the stakeholder group, um, you know, information, uh, impacts of climate change, things that I've heard over the previous presentation. So we'll walk through this slide and then I'll touch on some of those things that I think uh, are important. Um, so this uh, program, as with the other presentations we've seen, does establish a regional reliability metric that metric is one event day in 10 years, uh, LOLE. Um, we are very carefully sort of monitoring the progress that our colleagues are making on sort of better informed uh, reliability metrics and we'll incorporate that into our continuous process improvement um, in this program. We've tried to utilize thoughtful modeling and analytics to do a couple of things. So the first one is to try to identify those hours with the greatest need. And in our program, this is known as the capacity critical hours. Um, this is sort of a look at those hours where we think the, the, the market and capacity may be uh, the tightest. That's uh, informed and developed in the following way. We start with gross load. Uh, we take off variable energy resource performance. That gets us to something uh, close to a net peak. Uh, we've made a very thoughtful sort of analysis of interchange. One of our previous uh, commenters mentioned sort of exports into and out of the region. So we've worked with our participants to look at those um, exports that they've made and sort of break those down. What in, on the toughest hour may have been available to stay in the footprint? You know, what was a purely economic sale that's going to leave the footprint? And we've also tried to look very closely at the impacts, particularly on solar, of sort of the shape of the load throughout the day. We're taking a forecasted set of resources, what we expect to be on the system in that two to five year window, and sort of applying that resource shape to a set of historical data to help us better understand what the loads are going to look like. The second thing we have to do is sort of have a resource and a capacity accreditation methodology. Um, folks have talked about that, and Nick touched on it as part of his presentation. So what are we going to do to determine the qualifying capacity contribution of these resources? Uh, that is a mix of sort of ELCC, um, a traditional kind of forced outage factor for um, uh, thermals, and I'll talk about that in just a minute, the impact of climate change on that, and then also a way to uh, accredit storage hydro um, that is aware, as one of the commenters said, of their ability to sort of, you know, store water, the benefit of storage, uh, what could have been utilized above historical um, production. Um, our reliability metric is really that planning reserve margin. What amount of capacity is needed uh, to meet that one in 10 LOLE? We've currently modeled that in three different ways. As a whole footprint, we can effectively call this sort of the copper sheet, or as good as it could be if we could maximize the sharing of that diversity. 
we've, we've also broken that down into regions. So this is very akin to sort of uh, the WEC analysis. In, in our footprint, we've broken it down into two regions. You know, roughly the Pacific Northwest, that would include uh, Montana, uh, parts of Wyoming, and then the eastern side of the footprint and the desert southwest. Um, to Elaine's point, we have not uh, included um, California in this modeling, but we've got a planning reserve margin, a copper sheet as good as it could be, a sub-regional planning reserve margin that recognizes some of the uh, potential inabilities or constraints in uh, transferring diversity between um, these regions. Uh, and then we'll talk about this in a second, but deliverability is a critical component of this program. You know, we need more than steel in the ground resources. We have to get those resources to load. So we've been very thoughtful about our treatment of deliverability. Um, the, the compliance obligation, as I mentioned previously, is set seven months in advance of the operating day. It is a P50 plus um, PRM requirement. Um, we have a simplified transmission model. So this is not an optimized power flow. Uh, it is a pipe and bubble, um, not a physical network model. Um, I'm gonna touch on a few of the things that now I think are kind of important. This does include purchases and sales between subregions. So because we have such a large footprint, our participants are able to tell us the supply that they have both contracted for from outside the region and supply that they are sending outside of the region. It really gives us insight into some of those assumptions um, that generally folks have to make. You know, we have an understanding of what that contracted for um, supply looks like. If we talk about the load forecast, I want to talk a little bit about the impact of climate change. So we've heard strongly from our stakeholders that the load we're forecasting in the future should be aware of the impacts of climate change. That could be um, electrification, differences in weather, uh, et cetera. Sarah mentioned our program review committee. This idea of load forecasting and making sure we're taking into account the impact of climate change is going to be addressed in that stakeholder driven process. We're looking to the broader community to say, what is it we need to be incorporating to ensure that when we set a load, um, a metric to apply the planning reserve margin to, that it is aware of the impact of climate change. Uh, one final thing, we talked about granularity of data, particularly as it uh, pertains to resource accreditation. So one of the issues was uh, GAD's data. You know, we know that climate change is going to have an impact, ambient temperature has an impact on, say, the performance of thermal resources. So uh, again, that's information that we have that we're tracking over time to try to better understand uh, what the impacts of, of climate change may be on um, a resource accreditation. Thermal DZ, what is the impact of changes in ambient temperature, ability to access fuel, storage hydro in the same regard. Our owner operators of storage hydro account for roughly 40% of our resource stack. So that's something we're paying a very close attention to. <clears throat> um, deliverability insurance, assurance that so we want to talk about this. We've got to be able to get that capacity to the load. Um, we are requiring a firm or conditional firm uh, transmission to meet 75% of your P50 plus PRM requirement. You know, we live in a sort of contract path-based world. We know there's some concerns and considerations there. Um, we have paired this with a robust exception framework. Uh, now we get to the operations program. So this is where things get interesting. We've got this contract path-based path, path uh, uh, sort of world that we're living in that we have to take into account. So we're going to address this in the operations program. The operations program is all about evaluating what a participant's sort of performance looks like on the operating day relative to the forward showing. The assumption is that you come into that operating day with capacity equal to the P50 plus PRM. We're going to look at what your load looks like, look at how your VARES are performing. Uh, some folks are going to have lower load, maybe higher VAR performance. They may be surplus. Other folks, higher load a low VAR performance, maybe forced outages above what was anticipated, they may be deficit. Um, those folks that have a surplus uh, have an obligation then to provide that surplus to the deficit entities at our program's uh, agreed settlement. We're encouraging folks to use the market if they can, but that capacity in the program is there if they need it. We're starting to forecast that deficiency seven days in advance. Uh, it does become a binding on the pre-scheduled day. I mean, it's, it's very important. Folks are relying on this capacity. Uh, if folks do not deliver, 
uh, they may be exposed to a, a non-delivery penalty. Uh, so real quick, some pro uh, program design updates. These are things that folks may not have seen. Um, we spent a lot of time trying to understand how we're going to change, exchange diversity in the southwest and, and uh, eastern side of our footprint. Um, we've done established VAERS zones and worked through a preliminary accreditation on that. Um, our program is a bit unique and that has two seasons with a monthly compliance requirement. So we've spent a lot of time talking about that. Uh, capacity accreditation and load forecasting I already touched on. Um, settlement, uh, the forward showing defici deficiency charge. So uh, there is a cost of new entry penalty for being deficient in the forward showing. I wanna be very careful to say it is not our intent. Um, we do not want to be charging uh, this to folks. We really wanna set them up to be successful in the program. Uh, this is not intended to be sort of a transfer of wealth. Um, cost allocation, how do folks pay for the program? How do loads participate? And then how are we going to get folks from where they are now um, to a binding uh, uh, portion of the program? So very high level overview there, uh, quick, lots of information, but I'll pass it on to Sarah to talk about where we're at currently. Yeah, this is our last slide, and then we hopefully have a little time for your questions. We saw one come through on the chat, so um, Ryan, maybe you can think about how to answer the question on data. We know there's high demand for this data. Uh, we are at a place where we are in the um, preparation of our tariff. I mentioned that earlier. That is a very important milestone for us. We file it at FERC. We go through the FERC process. That process hopefully is a smooth one that gets us definitive orders by the end of the year, the ability to issue agreements for participation in the program. That's really how we move forward and plan for the binding season, which I mentioned earlier, the first binding season is summer of 2024. You back up seven months from that and that's when we do the planning and the forward showing components. What I really wanna emphasize as my last word here is that this is a starting place, a very important starting place for the region that the region has never had the benefit of. It has the potential to bring a lot of diversity from the region and to really flex that diversity muscle for the benefit of all in the area of resource adequacy. It is a more simple approach in terms of all of the different ideas we've heard today and the innovations on resource adequacy. I think we have always said in Western Power Pool with RA that we are working to leave a space for improvements and evolution. Ryan, I'm gonna turn it to you because of course someone is at the door. So I'm gonna go off real quick. Sure, and, right. and so I think this, this sort of goes to that idea of how are we going to bridge the gap uh, to, you know, from where we're at now to where the folks that have sort of spoken previously have indicated that we can go. You know, we're, we're sort of want to be sort of the practical embodiment of what it is that folks think are uh, achievable in the Western uh, interconnect. So, you know, we're hoping to form the foundation to realize all of the benefits um, that the other folks, you know, the other presenters today have said are capable as we move towards that sort of deep uh, decarbonization um, uh, of the grid. You know, it, it's been a sizable undertaking. We believe there is significant value um, to the Western Interconnect. We are excited to partner with the folks um, that we've heard uh, speak today. You know, once we get this program set up, once we have a good foundation for resource adequacy in the Western Interconnect, then how are we going to sort of move from that uh, point to the end game that folks have said, you know, is uh, achievable, help get the grid from you know, uh, to, to that decarbonized state that we are all sort of heading towards. Thanks, Ryan. Were we able to address the question on data? Did we get to that? Uh, I will in just a second. I'm going Great. to, uh, excuse me, stop sharing here and, and look at the, the chat. And Ryan, I think I can um, tee that up for you and, and also ask a couple of related sure. questions. Um, I think the question, thank you both Sarah and Ryan for that great presentation. I think it's a really helpful overview um, for everyone on this call about where RAP, is, where RAP is right now and where it's going and the opportunities it provides. Um, the question in the chat was about whether 
the RAP metrics will be publicly available and particularly be available to interested parties to use in conversations with state regulators, state policymakers. Um, and I think a related question on that is, um, how is RAP's current work helping to inform resource decisions that the utilities are making right now? In particular, um, is the RAP program being designed such that individual utilities can use RAP's data or methods to run their own RA analysis um, to inform their decision making? Okay, so I'll, I'll take a run at, at a couple of these and then I'll turn it over to Sarah. Um, so the answer is yes, we currently have an indicative set of planning reserve margins for these regions, um, as well as kind of ELCC and QCC values for resources. Uh, we as a program sort of value transparency and, and we want to sort of, you know, when we're confident in those numbers, we'll be putting those out for um, the public. There's a couple of things that are unique to our program, as I mentioned, sort of the two seasons, uh, the monthly compliance metric, and then we're trying to sort of, you know, make a fair assessment of the results of our ELCC studies. So once the sort of group has confidence that, that these are the numbers we'll be moving forward with in that forward showing, they'll set the non-binding compliance metrics, uh, we do plan to uh, release that information. We think transparency from the program perspective uh, is important. I do want to note we're very sensitive to sort of the release of data because some of that may be commercially sensitive for our participants so that, you know, when we talk about data, what will we release, what we'll talk about publicly, and we are sort of trying to um, balance that. Um, I'll, I'll touch maybe on the resource planning and then, and then turn it over to Sarah. You know, we really strongly hope that the information that comes out of the RAP can be utilized by our individual participants. That's part of sort of the value proposition of this program outside of sort of general enhanced reliability. You know, we want to allow our participants to make decisions not in a vacuum have the best information available to them. Many of our participants currently are looking towards sort of the models used by the RAP, saying how can I update my planning processes to incorporate both the tools and the information um, that the program makes available. So I very much think that's, that's a value to our participants. You know, we've, we're hearing that not only in Washington, but across the footprint. Sarah, maybe I'll turn it over to you to follow. Yeah, I just want to emphasize a point I made earlier, which also gets to uh, a comment from James Adcock about how utilities wrap should balance um, RA as we look at it across the region versus state specific requirements laws around resources. And the, the element here is that we've done everything we can to design wrap so that it is a regional approach, but that it remains flexible. Um, we do what we can in that department. Nevertheless, we're still looking across the region and coming up with common rules for counting resources and setting a requirement for the program in terms of what is the RA requirement. So we recognize that the potential for conflict can exist. Although again, to emphasize, RAP does in no way dictate what kind of resources you choose. It has common counting rules for different resource types and resources within certain zones, but it does not touch resource choice. That is the area of exclusive jurisdiction for the states, and we recognize that in our program. Nevertheless, what we have tried to do and what we make ourselves available to do now and ongoing is to have the conversations in the region, work with states, work with agencies, offices, the Public Utility Commission, legislatures, if that's necessary to, to convey what is the value proposition of the RAP, what are we trying to deliver with RAP that a single state acting by itself cannot deliver, that load-serving entities are bound if they are acting with only their own resource set with the limited geography, lim limited access to resources. RAP is a way for getting more diversity out of the system and potentially lowering requirements for participants because we're leveraging that diversity. That doesn't mean that there won't be adjustments, particularly as participants are looking at their first set of requirements. This is the first time we're doing this. It is always a little bit of a jolt to jump into a new program. I think the same goes with data 
our objective Western Power Pool, we hear the region loud and clear that the desire for data is very high. We have to tell a story with our data about what is the state of RA in the region. We want to do that. We're just not quite ready to do that, but we are working towards it. And that is our commitment to the region. Nora? Thanks so much, Sarah and Ryan. Um, I'm going to pass it to Glenn because I know he has a question for you. I'll, I'd also invite um, other folks on the call if you have a question that you'd like to ask Rap or potentially a question from earlier today, please feel free to raise your hand and we'll try to get to everyone. Glenn. Thank you. And, um, you know, I want to say first that, that um, we, we uh, feel like the RAP Resource Adequacy Program has a lot of potential um, to bring rigor and accountability to this very important objective of uh, ensuring adequate resources and, and to take advantage of uh, really huge efficiencies if we do it together instead of each utility trying to do it on its own. So with that in mind, I, I, I'm gonna ask you the same question I asked you last year, Sarah, which is uh, for the, the map of Washington, it shows that um, the entire state is participating, but then the list of utilities doesn't include every utility in Washington. And so uh, I just wanna make sure that the map is accurate and to have you explain the, how the arrangement where a utility, their customers are, would be benefiting from participation in this program, even if their utility isn't on the list. Sure, and I'll do my best, Glenn, but I don't have perfect visibility into some of the arrangements of the Bonneville Power Administration. So that's really the key to my answer to you. In terms of the state regulated entities, who is on the list is who is on the list today for the non-binding design phases. There is an opportunity coming up, a very important, a very critical one, one that I ask for the support of everyone on this call to continue to support RAP and its success. We desperately need this framework. We can always improve on it over time, but we don't have this today and we desperately need it. So Glenn, I very much appreciate your comments about seeing what we're trying to do here. The entities that are state regulated are who we have so far. I would say without disclosing, we, we get calls all the time from load serving entities across the entire West wanting to know more for those that haven't been involved on, on a detailed basis. There is unique, there are unique arrangements with Bonneville Power Administration for Washington and the diversity of load serving entities in Washington. Bonneville has been having its own series of R8. Well, they at least had one. Uh, and it was just this week, I think. Right. Yeah, Monday. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and they're talking to their customers about what Bonneville's participation in RAP means for them. For example, BPA, as far as I understand it, from my limited viewpoint, BPA will take the wrap obligation for its load following customer. So if it has load following utilities, you can, you can assume based on information we have today that they are actually in wrap. But Bonneville is serving as their load responsible entity. So that's why you're only going to see their name on the list. We do have interest participation from other customers of BPA who take other products other than load following. And you'll see those separately listed with their own identity. So if I haven't covered a utility of interest, either through the load following category or the other products, then it's possible they aren't engaged and we're happy to work with whoever we might. I mean, our goal is to create a framework that brings diversity benefits and everyone will want to be a part of it. In fact, one thing that I've been hearing participants remark on is that this framework sets up a kind of access to a very valuable set of RA resources. And that as we go forward in the system and the system becomes tighter and more scarce, being the benefit of membership in this RA club, if you will, is, is really very critical. And it creates its own momentum in that regard. So I hope, hope that's helpful, Glenn. It is, you know, and I, uh, I'd love to hear, I think it's basically the slice block customers, um, 
you know, if they're coming in through the uh, Energy Authority or through Shell, some other arrangement uh, that where they're not on the list, uh, it would be helpful to make sure that uh, we're able to see their participation. And I, I'm, so I'm really not directing that comment to you, Sarah. I'm directing okay. it to. Thank you. And uh, we'll, we're happy to help where Clark, we can. Clark, Benton, Grays Harbor, Lewis, Pacific, PUDs. Uh, yeah, that, that would be some of them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I want to go ahead and um, call on Commissioner Rendell, who has a question. Good morning, everyone, or I guess it's now afternoon, but thanks so much, uh, Sarah and Ryan, for being here and sharing with us this really innovative program, understanding that it's not yet filed with FERC, will be hopefully soon. Um, and so at the point, hopefully, that FERC does approve this model, there's been a lot of extensive outreach and engagement between all of the utilities, with the state entities, not just commissions, but also state energy offices and, and governor's offices. There's been a lot of regional engagement on this topic. So I'm going to just assume and hope that this goes through FERC. Once that is done and you get the commitments from um, the load serving entities that want to participate, I'm assuming, again, hopefully, that um, RAP will engage in more conversations with the region um, to the extent you can exchange and share data and to the extent you can report on sort of how things are going so that we continue that feedback loop with RAP and the region, not just the member utilities, but all, all of the interested folks engaged. Commissioner Rendall, I so much appreciate that comment. You and I have had dialogue on this really important issue about the access to the data, and we do hear you. I think um, going to Ryan's comments, we're just in an awkward point in time right now. Otherwise, we would have brought what we could today to talk about data it's, um, of high interest, we know. Um, we do recognize the responsibility that we have if if load serving entities are gonna use this information to make decisions, we have to figure out what can we share. We just don't wanna reveal anyone's position. That is the thing we are very, very sensitive to. It's the first time that Western Power Pool has ever had access to that kind of highly sensitive data. I didn't mention this before, but many of you know that our technical provider of the analysis administration of a lot of the details is SPP, Southwest Power Pool, who we call our program operator. And so the duty to protect that data is incumbent on both Western Power Pool and Southwest Power Pool. It's a unique arrangement. We're working with the participants very actively to get comfortable with the information we're seeing so far and then make decisions about what we can put out there so that we can have that kind of dialogue. Thank well, you, I appreciate it. Yeah, the other thing I wanted to say is I didn't mention this element either, but on the governance slide, there's also a box for something we're calling um, an independent evaluator. And this is a, the idea of this is it's an outside organization with the, with the ability, the capability to analyze the performance of our program after the fact. So we would run the program, we would subject uh, the independent evaluator to our data and performance metrics, and they would be able to look at it and then analyze it and also share with the world, Committee of State Representatives, Program Review Committee, RAPSI, and the public, what the data is showing about, are we, are we hitting the mark? Are we meeting the goals that we set out to meet? So I think that's a really important channel for the feedback loop that you mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Commissioner Rendell. I'm gonna to turn to Nicholas Garcia from Waputa for the last question before we break for lunch. Nicholas, it's very hard for us to hear you. I apologize. It's quite muffled. I'm sorry, I don't know how to- I can hear you. Okay, I will just speak louder. I apologize if people think I'm yelling. It's not my intention. In any case, um, quick question about localized uh, reliability issues. Earlier, Ryan pointed out that you, may, you need to make sure you can both actually deliver the power from those who have it to those who might be short for whatever reason on an immediate basis. 
Um, and I was wondering whether or not you're going to identify areas of needed transmission upgrades in order to enhance that delivery value, similarly to how you identify utilities that are short on their um, capacity and give them an opportunity to cure that shortfall. Thank you. Ryan, did you hear that? Okay, I'll take a shot at it. Let me take a shot at it. I heard it. The question was, you know, this program has the potential to show us where transmission constraints are resulting in RA capacity inefficiencies. Like for example, because of a transmission constraint in our footprint, we may have to have a slightly higher planning reserve margin in that constrained zone because we just can't get out the full capability of the resource set inside of that constrained zone. We recognize that possibility. I'll be very candid with everyone. The way the West has approached grid integration is to use the evolutionary or incremental step where we pursue market optimization over here and then we've got resource adequacy happening under Western Power Pool. Western Power Pool also happens to administer the regional planning, transmission planning organization called Northern Grid, which is a very similar footprint to RAP, not the same, but similar. And we have that potential to start using data from one area in another area, but I'll just be very honest that one of the downsides of the incremental evolutionary approach of the West, which is the only approach that's actually changed anything or yielded outcomes, that benefit customers has some downsides to it. And one of those downsides are, there's not an easy pathway for using that category of data in one area and using it in another area that's designed separately, has a separate tariff, has a separate approach generally. But the potential to start asking those questions and using those sources of information and the different functionality pieces of grid integration is there. It's just not perfect today. Also, I would add just one more thing before we're done here that, okay. that in our forward showing 75%, um, you know, requirement to show uh, generation to load and, and that's paired with the 25% and the exception framework. And so, you know, the Pisani region, for example, um, in the Seattle area, we know has constraints so I think we'll have some information about the exceptions that folks are looking to get within that 25% that might help the region understand, look, what are those deliverability issues you might have in the forward showing? Uh, um, in the operations program, you know, especially in the desert Southwest, um, we have sort of a dynamic delivery of this um, uh, shared diversity. And so we'll have some understanding of where folks are able to deliver to, where they can pick up, what are the reasons they may not have been able to utilize uh, other delivery points. And so this is all information that is not sort of, you know, optimized power flow type of information, but in our contract path-based world gives us some indication of where the, the need may be. And also we are modeling some exchange between subregions. Um, you know, we have the ability on a sort of scenario-based basis to model additional transmission capability between zones, which would be reflected in a lower planning reserve margin. That might give us some indication of sort of what additional diversity benefit might be gained from uh, transmission, assuming you can get it permitted, built, and, and cost shared. Thank you much so much, Sarah and Ryan, for that great presentation and um, helpful answers to questions. We're really excited to see RAP coming together and really appreciate the update from all of you. Um, we're going to be breaking now for lunch. We'll be coming back at 1.15, but I did just want to quickly pass to Glenn, who has an announcement um, about our sessions this afternoon. That's right. Thank you. And, and thanks, everybody, for uh, you know what we were able to discuss this morning. and. Uh, I'm sorry that we didn't get to uh, every question on every presentation, and I appreciate the uh, way people have used the chat to help extend some of the, the interaction in a very constructive way. Um, this afternoon, we're going to uh, discuss uh, some survey information that, that we collected. I mean, it's not a survey like, you know, asking 500 people what we should do about resource adequacy. But it was more of a suggestion box approach 
which uh, we added to this year's, uh, you know, kind of model for doing the, uh, the resource adequacy meeting. And uh, there's a total of 26 suggestions uh, that we received that way. And uh, what I'm, what I want to do is uh, put those up on the screen. They're also available on the resource adequacy webpage if you want to look at it, um, you know, on your own computer. And so over the lunch hour, um, if, if you have um, suggestions about which suggestions we should prioritize, uh, if you could do those on the, in the chat, just, you know, while we're, while we leave it open. And uh, I would invite both you know, think statements about, I would like to talk about such and such, or I would like to hear about such and such. And then we will uh, uh, take all those, uh, you know, that input and try to uh, come up with a, a set of uh, kind of most uh, interesting suggestions that we can discuss during that part of the meeting today. So, uh, with that, I will put the the uh, screen up, and then uh, I'll put the uh, suggestions up, and then uh, we can all go have have some lunch. Thank you. Is that is that showing up okay? Um, no? Right now, we're we're seeing your inbox, Glenn. My um, inbox, dang it! Try I again. Just just a reminder for everyone, we'll be back here um, at 1.15. Our first session will be with the utilities, and then we'll be talking about those recommendations we received via survey. They are up now, Glenn. Okay. Thank you.
Okay, good afternoon, everyone. It's 1.15, so in order to keep us uh, on schedule, we're gonna go ahead and get started again. Um, unless anyone from the staff team needs more time. Um, I think we'll just move forward with the agenda. Um, so, so far this morning, we've heard from a number of different groups about ways to analyze resource adequacy and what the results of those analysis say about, uh, about RA in the West and the Pacific Northwest. Um, now we're gonna hear from utilities who are ultimately responsible for having the sufficient capacity to serve their customers. And on this panel, we have Avista Utilities, Bonneville Power Administration, and Snohomish County PUD. So I will hand it over to um, Avista is first on the agenda, but whoever would like to go first. Good afternoon, this is James at the Vista. I guess I will be going first and uh, sorry for the little pause there. I turned my uh, screen share on and my ability to mute and share my video went away. So, uh, well, thank you for having me today. And I would just like to say um, the picture of our lovely Spokane building is not taken today because we are a little bit gloomy here today. And actually, I don't think we've had a, a, a that pleasant of a day this year. It's It's been a definitely a different uh climate this year uh, going around. So uh, to get started with, um, I want to give a little bit of overview of Avista for those of you that um, are not familiar with us. Um, I'm going to try to burn through some of these slides fairly quickly just due to time, but uh, we are in eastern Washington, the northern Idaho electric utility. We also serve customers uh, with natural gas in Oregon as well as Washington and Idaho. Our supply mix is Primarily 60% renewable energy. This is actually our capacity, not actually the energy that's served, but this is for our uh, both states combined. And we have a unique uh, load profile here in Eastern Washington where we actually are dual peaking. Um, we have a um, large energy requirement in the winter as shown in the blue line that actually is more energy intensive uh, compared to the summertime, which is more peaking intensive uh, due to heat. One unique thing about Avista is historically we've been mostly winter peaking and summer has come up as kind of a new phenomenon for Avista to consider due to a shift of air conditioning load, but also we've had a number of customers shift from using electric to heat their homes to natural gas. Um, both of these we would need to serve uh, with a, a plenty margin from a resource adequacy point of view that's been discussed earlier today. And as part of that, we have needs for both winter and summer capacity. Um, and our first need is in 2026. And uh, these needs are shown here, um, don't reflect the resource adequacy program earlier dis discussed, but it's something we actually are looking forward to um, as an implementation in our IRP planning process and all of our processes going forward, because what we think this will do for our customers is lower the amount of new resources we would need to acquire because we'll be taking into account uh, regional resources. Without a wrap, we would be needing to acquire these higher uh, resource needs because there's no guarantee through the market mechanisms that there would be resource capacity available to us. Um, just keep in mind, as I when I showed you that load profile before, winter days require more energy than summer days. So when you think about uh, meeting that winter need, we would either need to from a, like say a storage perspective, we need a longer duration storage or we need to be more dependent on the market. And this is something that's fairly unique to Avista um, just due to our, our situation of our climate. Um, currently we're evaluating RFP proposals to fill these resource needs. And we expect to have a uh, contracts with uh, the bidders from that proposal process, hopefully in Q1 of next year. One of the things we're seeing in the marketplace is concerns of resource adequacy. Over the last several years, beginning in 2018, we are seeing the market start to respond to shortfalls of energy and using resources that are higher in the supply stack. In this chart, this is a representation of the relationship between power and gas since 1996. This relationship shows as the charts, uh, the line charts spike, that indicates there's a tightening of the supply 
in the region for resource adequacy. You can see in 2000, 2001, during the energy crisis, the spike was very severe where we had to utilize uh, a lot of diesel generation and uh, other unique circumstances to uh, serve load, and in some cases, not able to serve load. We're starting to see that again in the last few years where prices are increasing and um, we are not expecting to see that to diminish. You can see in the little red line on the right is the forward markets showing a similar uh, resource shortfall. One of the unique things though, looking at forward versus backward in this um, line is that the Climate Commitment Act that's up and coming next year, um, which is gonna be reflected somehow into prices going in the future and how that reflection in prices is gonna be, we don't know yet. Is the region responding to this? I think utilities are. This is a, uh, a table uh, from PNUC and their regional forecast uh, this year. This shows a, a combination of the Northwest Utilities planned acquisitions, but most of these resource acquisitions are wind and solar and a little bit of storage. These resources do not have significant capacity ex um, expectations for the meeting um, both winter and summer needs. You can see on the right is maybe an example of summer peak contribution, but it'll be interesting to see how these resources will actually fit into uh, the regional RAP program. But there is concern that as resources are retiring, these new resources are not enough to replace them, which is probably why we are seeing in the forward markets uh, continual um, price uh, high prices. Some of the challenges I'd like to talk about um, for Avista is uh, new electrification. Uh, transportation electrification gets a lot of the attention, um, but right now, um, the one that's scary to the utility side is building electrification. And the reason for this from a resource adequacy concern is more important than maybe transportation is, think about transportation is something that we could possibly move uh, between hours in the day. We're building electrification comes with a significant amount of energy in the winter time. And this chart on the right illustrates an actual historical year of a Vista's load in black and what that electric load would have been if all of our Washington customers converted to um, space heating and water heating using uh, electric uh, heat pumps and hot water heat pumps as well. You can see our peak load significantly increases in the winter time, but is hardly changed in the summertime. When thinking about a resource adequacy future with our all the renewable resources, this amount of energy and peak needs are a little bit of a concern for a utility like us in the wintertime where solar will not produce a lot of power for us and the ability to store power would require substantial seasonal duration, uh, seasonal storage resources. Also thinking about what our customers feel about uh, electrification, we recently did a survey of our customers around clean energy and reliability. 65% of our customers are extremely concerned about electric reliability. And part of this comes down to, you know, this dual fuel um, benefit that a lot of our customers experience during the winter when you can still use your uh, natural gas furnace for uh, heating or your uh, gas for uh, water heater for uh, a warm shower. There's a built-in uh, resiliency within using two different systems. Another challenge that's kind of unique to the Northwest and isn't necessarily affecting the investor-owned utilities as much as the public utilities is new loads from industrial or crypto that create base, or base load uh, loads, but actually may have the potential to have an ability to dispatch to prices and uh, make them adjustable loads. Some of the resource uh, adequacy risk and opportunities for the state include uh, CETA. Actually, how we view CETA right now in the draft rules is there is a reliability risk or a risk of not beating the zero emission goals in 2045. And also prior to 2045, we worry about resource adequacy due to lack of utilities investing in reliable resources today, hoping for uh, significant improvement in storage in the future or some other resource that may come along. When we look at the differences between CETA and the CCA, both of them are, do create issues for trading power with our neighboring states, and these barriers will either reduce the reliability or the ability to meet emission goals. 
As a preference between the two, CCA is likely to be a better option to help us meet our resource adequacy needs than CETA does. Um, CETA also creates this potential for overbuilding variable resources. VISTA sees a regional coordination mechanism may be warranted to lower this risk. I don't necessarily know what that coordination is yet, but uh, as long as individual utilities continue to plan separately, there is a high potential for overbuilding within the state. And with this overbuilding of new resources, they may not necessarily serve the peak needs for resource adequacy. But also to think about um, overbuilding comes down to transmission. And in the region right now, we are using existing transmission and, and selecting resources based on that existing transmission. For at least for a VISTA, the existing transmission will not be, uh, will be taken up from our resource acquisitions over the next decade. And after the next decade would require new, new transmission to integrate any new resources. So in order for us to acquire new renewable resources in the 2030s or even 2040s require us to start building new transmission now to meet those goals without a specific uh, resource that we can point to or, or use as far as cost recovery justification. The other consideration we have to think about as far as transmission for resource adequacy is system sales off of our system. When we have a, a, a set of resources that are likely to be in excess of our load during certain times of year, we'll need a way to move that power to other regions to recover some of our costs from that resources. So new transmission is also needed for that purpose as well. Um, the last thing I want to talk about in my presentation is uh, winter extremes uh, due to climate change. And what we are seeing from climate change is definitely a lot of attention on summertime, but we're not spending a lot of attention on the winter. And winter um, is still expected to have extreme risk, which I'm going to show in the next slide, but is an extreme risk to vulnerable customers. While extreme heat has risk to customers, extreme cold may have a larger risk due to the ability to act, inability to access heat and over during a longer period of time. So this is a chart for Spokane of the last uh, 70 years for low temperatures for each year. You can see we've had a couple rough years where temperatures got down to around minus 15 degrees. These temperatures are the daily average, so it's the average of the high and low. So Vista is a little bit unique from the west side of the state where we can get some fairly severe temperatures. The data on the right is representing uh, 19 different climate change futures for the Spokane area coldest day of the year temperatures. You can see that some of these um, uh, simulations show future temperatures that are significantly colder than we've seen in the past. While the trend is definitely an increasing warming trend, but the variability of that temperatures is greater than it has been in the past. So at Avista, we are definitely concerned about summer and what climate change can do for the summer, but we also need to focus on winter uh, to protect our vulnerable customers. And I think that's all I have for today. I appreciate the time and look forward to questions after the other presenters. Great, thank you. So we're gonna go ahead and um, move to uh, Bonneville for the next presentation and we'll have some questions at the end. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm Rachel Dibble and uh, let's see, do you have my presentation that you can share or would you like me to share that? I'm trying to see um, if I can. Are you able to share that? Let me see. If not, I believe. No, I, th you... I think I can. Let's, okay. let's see if I can do that. All right, can you see that screen? Yes, thank you. Okay, let me switch this over. All right. All right, well, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Um, for those of you who participated in this, uh, um, this uh, forum last year, some of these slides will look a little familiar to you. I think what, um, what we wanted to do was uh, provide some perspective on the role Bonneville plays uh, in the region, uh, in the area of resource adequacy. We just had a great presentation from uh, from Avista, and there's 
one from Snohomish coming up that I think talks much more specifically about uh, retail utilities and how they plan um, and some of those concerns. But Bonneville also plays um, a different role uh, because um, we do supply some of uh, that uh, that capacity and, and we uh, we um, have are responsible for the assets um, of the generating as well as the transmission assets in the region. Um, and one of the things that we have done is uh, we have been very actively engaged in the uh, Western Resource Adequacy Program that the Western Power Pool has been developing. Um, resource adequacy has been an area that um, we've been very engaged with. And I know Sarah and Ryan talked to you earlier today about um, more specifics around that program. Um, but I did want to just make sure that we're um, being very clear that Bonneville really supports this program and has been actively engaged in uh, putting together uh, the elements of the program as well as the different measures and um, just getting that program in place. Um, and the reason that we did that is because, um, one, we are very concerned with resource adequacy. It's something we've always had a responsibility for. Uh, and so it was a program that we felt like could really bring some benefits um, to Bonneville, to our customers and the region. Uh, and some of those areas, I'll just talk about them quickly. I'm sure they were probably covered earlier, but um, at Bonneville, we feel like just the the um, getting to a place where we have resource adequacy obligations that are clear and transparent. Everyone knows what their responsibility is um, that we all agree to uh, and have an enforceable standard. Um, that would be a really positive step for the reason for the region. Um, more certainty, more data. Um, that's always a good thing when you're planning uh, to go out uh, and um, and make sure that we're all able to serve the region. Um, another important element for us was that transmission deliverability always be uh, included in that standard, that it isn't just generation, although that is often what gets um, a lot of the attention, but it's very important that, um, that we are also factoring in making sure that that generation can actually be delivered um, to the places where it's, uh, where it's needed. And Rachel, we're still seeing your first slide. If you want to advance to the second slide. Um, are you on the the BPA participation in resource um, No, we're, we're still on your cover slide. Oh, it's advancing in mine. Hmm. Okay. Are you are you able to see that? Yeah, that looks great. Yes, thank okay. you. Okay. Um, I'll just keep it on this view then <laughs> so that you can so that you can see it. Okay. So um uh, the, another area we see a lot of benefits is the operational program, um, uh, that it can provide some supply alternatives um, to the spot market. So I know that we have talked a lot um, over the years about a concern with what availability would be out there in the market. It's been a source of supply for many of us um, over many years. Uh, and um, as we all are looking forward, we see a real risk of that um, spot market either at a minimum becoming much more volatile, but um, also the real possibility that it um, also just have, have less uh, and not enough to serve everyone what they need. Um, and so putting together an operational program uh, that, uh, that gives us another, uh, another place where a group of us have agreed are going to be making supply available um, and, um, and helping each other out for compensation. Uh, that's, that's another benefit of the program for the region. Um, this next one, diversity, where you optimize existing resources across a broader footprint, um, that's kind of the foundation of uh, this program and also markets in general. Um, some of the supply markets in general is just when you're looking across a wider footprint, you all have the, the ability to potentially hold less than you would if you were planning only for your own. Uh, and then um, just the, the real, the proactive development of a regional program just provides benefits for us. We know that resource adequacy is an area of concern. It's something that regulators, um, uh, legislatures, uh, as all the way down to planners at individual utilities are concerned about. Um, so we felt like it was important that Bonneville be engaged in 
um, proactively uh, participating in and influencing a voluntary program um, that uh, shows that we are very uh, interested in looking for a program that works for all of us. Um, and also, uh, when there are clear issues on the horizon, we know that there is the possibility for uh, future mandates. And um, the more the region and the utilities can be working together and finding a solution, um, the better position we are in when those, um, when those mandates begin to be considered. So I'll talk a little bit about how we manage resource adequacy. I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Bonneville has always done this. All utilities have always done this. Um, we all have uh, the, uh, the, uh, some, some way that we have the obligation. Um, and then we measure what's, uh, what, uh, what the load is. We measure what the resources are. Um, and then we plan to serve them. And so all of us have always done that. And Bonneville has certainly always done that. Um, and so I'll just take you through like where that responsibility comes from. Um, for Bonneville and, and how we go about meeting that um, and as we have been doing over the years. Um, so it initially starts with the definition of what our responsibility in this area is, and that is largely a statutory responsibility. Um, under the Northwest Power Act, we are required to serve net requirements for utilities um, when they request it of us. Um, so we, we manage the assets of the Federal Columbia River Power System and the transmission system. Uh, and um, when a utility within our footprint that qualifies as a utility that we would serve asks us to meet those net requirements, um, that is something that we are obligated to do. Uh, that act also created the Northwest Power and Conservation Council. Um, so uh, that council also has um, some, uh, it does studies and looks at how Bonneville meets different obligations throughout the region and provides recommendations to Bonneville as well and has some other responsibilities. There's also uh, responsibilities under NERC definitions and resource adequacy is a reliability obligation under NERC and Bonneville is obligated uh, under the, those uh, reliability obligations under NERC. Uh, so then we move on to uh, if we have to serve net requirements when they're requested, how does that request come in? And so that is under our regional dialogue contracts. These are our wholesale power contracts uh, that are with our uh, public power customers throughout the region. Um, these regional dialogue contracts will be expiring in 2028 and we are in the process already of talking with our customers about what the next version of these contracts would look like, um, but our intent is that they would be another version of these long-term contracts uh, where we fully subscribe the system uh, with, um, with commitments to purchase uh, from those customers that we um, uh, that are under the contracts today. Um, so we have two kinds of products. There's a load following product, and then, well, actually three, slice, and then slice block. Um, and then we do have some customers who have block only. Um, but those are, I'll talk a little bit more about what those are on the next slide. Um, but those are the, those are basically the way that, um, that we sell that power. Um, and load following is the, the contract where the customers ask us to follow their load. And um, that includes the piece of resource adequacy. Uh, and then the slice and then the slice block and block. Um, those are customers who have said, no, we don't really need Bonneville to follow our load. Um, and so there's more of a consistent amount of Bonneville's uh, power that is provided to those customers. And then those customers follow their load. So like I said, I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. So then when we understand what the load is that we're being obligated for, we then um, start to uh, talk about, you know, okay, how much do we need? Um, and the way we do that is we have a BPA white book that many of you are probably familiar with. You can find it on our bpa.gov website. Um, but it's a 10 year look out on, you know, what are all of the loads and resources within the, um, within the region. Uh, and that we are required to serve and that what we will use to serve them, uh, and then all the different options for resources uh, that would serve them and looks out over a period of time um, to make sure that we're identifying and having a clear picture of what it is that we need to serve. We also factor in all these different load serving entities that we do provide power for. We also factor in the, their own resources that we'll be serving because then that is taken off the top of what Bonneville would be responsible for serving. So then we have a couple of ways that we 
uh, with all of that information, we look at, okay, how do we make sure we have enough to be able to meet all of these obligations? And one is our resource program. Uh, and that is a process um, within Bonneville where we um, go through many different scenarios um, based on historical data and future data uh, and, um, and look at all of the different um, scenarios of what that load and our resources could be um, and try to make sure that we are um, in a position where uh, we are planning for enough resources to be able to meet the, lead, the, uh, the load and the specific resources and the options that we would be able to use to meet that. If you're interested in more detail about the resource program, we are holding a public meeting on June 28th um, to go over this year's uh, resource program. Um, so you're welcome to, uh, to get into that on our event calendar and there's information um, that you can get more detail on that. Another piece of that is the energy efficiency programs. Um, so uh, while we have the FCRPS and our hydro and nuclear and, um, and all the other resources that we use to serve our vote, there's also a, another side of supporting energy, energy efficiency programs that then reduces the load and makes um, that more efficient um, so that the resources can be balanced out with that. Um, so all of those elements are the longer term where we're looking at out over a longer period of time. Um, but then when we get into implementation, the implementation is in the operational window. It's in that month out, week out, day out, hour out. What do we need um, in that period of time? And so we we implement that through our operations and marketing, how we dispatch or how we give dispatch requirements to our federal partners uh, for the dams and those who operate our generating resources, as well as how we um, interact with the market um, to make sure that we are balancing that uh, load and demand, as well as our short term planning and forecasting. So, uh, as I mentioned, we have two. Uh, two to three kinds of uh, products that we offer through our contracts. And these are the regional dialogue contracts. Uh, and um, so under the Northwest Power Act, we are required to meet the net requirements when a customer requests that of us. Uh, and so for net requirements, what that is, is it's the customer's load minus all of their resources, but then adding in an uncertainty and variability factor uh, for that. So um, the where resource adequacy lands is in that uncertainty variability factor. Um, it's who is responsible for following that load wherever it goes uh, and, and handling that long-term and short-term uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So um, as far as what Bonneville's responsibility is compared to what our customers' responsibilities, uh, it depends on which contract the customer chose. Um, to uh, to sign during the regional dialogue contract uh, contracting process. Um, and so in that first box, you have our load following contracts. So um, in this scenario, under that product, for those customers who selected this product, um, Bonneville is responsible and has taken on that responsibility to serve the net requirements um, of those load following customers. Um, and so, you can see where um, this is um, just a, a fictional and a load curve um, over time. Um, but you subtract out, we first, we subtract out what customer resources that load following customer has. Um, and then Bonneville is responsible for everything else. Um, and so uh, we, uh, um, you'll see Bonneville is responsible for following that load um, over time um, as it goes into peaks uh, and valleys. And then if you look in the box over on the right hand side, these are our, um, we do have uh, slice block customers and then we also have some block customers. Uh, and so for the block customer, you would just take out that slice part and that would also be part of the customer obligation. Um, but um, that responsibility is flipped. Um, so these are the customers who have, who did not choose to have Bonneville follow the net requirements, um, but said that they would rather have a um, a portion of their load be served by Bonneville Resources, and, um, and under this contract, we do agree to do that. They have Bonneville's resources as one of many resources towards serving their load, and they are responsible for following um, the, the peaks and uh, following their own load with their own resources um, or um, ways that they have uh, acquired resources. So Bonneville does not have the resource adequacy responsibility for those customers. It is the customers themselves who have the resource adequacy responsibility there. 
so for this slide, I'll just talk through a little bit where, um, where will RAP possibly change some of our responsibilities? Um, and uh, so if you look at these first two boxes, um, the first two really are not changed by RAP. These are things that um, we, uh, Bonneville is already uh, providing for resource adequacy and in these longer term, I mean, it doesn't change our statutes. We're still obligated under our statutes. We're still obligated to NERC. Um, and then as far as our contracts themselves, the RAP program does not change our contracts. And now as we negotiate the new contracts, resource adequacy will be a re reality in the environment. And so we are um, very likely to be negotiating with customers about some of those responsibilities um, because uh, RAP will be a new, um, possibly a new requirement as we're negotiating those. Um, but the RAP program itself does not impact our contracts. Uh, and then uh, in the portion of how much we need, um, so the white book, what we do expect is that um, RAP will add a, a planning metric um, to, uh, to the white book. Um, the, the PRM in the RAP um, is something that um, Bonneville will need to be uh, taking into account um, as a RAP participant if we do choose uh, to join the, the program uh, in the binding period. Um, so that will be, um, just to be clear, that's a planning requirement. It's not a load requirement. Uh, and so uh, that's a way that RAP could be uh, impacting. Also in the resource um, program uh, in the box for how do we ensure we have enough, uh, we have the RAP program, the resource program and the EE programs. Um, it's possible there is another integrated planning metric uh, that may um, that we may be incorporating into the needs assessment um, that we would be evaluating uh, through the resource program, um, just because that RAP requirement is there. And then when we move into the ops and marketing, I mean, how we implement um, the RAP would add a forward showing capacity requirement um, that we would need to meet at, um, right now it's a seven month out requirement. Um, there would also be the pre-schedule and hold back notice and release of the forward showing. Uh, that would be in that operational time frame, and then um, also the the deployment or release of that holdback uh, at that T minus 90 in the operational hour. Um, so those are all things that the RAP could impact uh, in this entire uh, program uh, as we think about how our resource adequacy planning would change uh, with with a RAP program. Um, so just talk again a bit, a bit about re, the resource uh, program, um, what that does. I'm mean, going to talk about this a little bit. It looks at the uncertainty in loads, water supply, gas and electricity prices, um, just to identify what all of Bonneville's um, power services obligations are. That doesn't change uh, with RAP. That's still something we would continue to do. Um, it also looks at all the potential solutions we have to be able to meet those needs. Um, and that will still be being done. Uh, uh, even without RAP. Um, what, uh, where, where there could be some changes to our processes um, under the RAP program uh, is that um, RAP will have different guidelines um, and different standards and, uh, and um, a measure that we will have to show that we are meeting um, both in generation and transmission. Um, and so that would start to be factored into our resource program. Um, so as I mentioned before, for the resource program, uh, we have several metrics that we already look at. Um, the, the RAP standard would be added in as another metric that we would look at, but we would continue to be looking at all of these other metrics that we already look at. So this is just how we um, think about what are the different scenarios uh, that um, a way to look at the loads and resources that we need to be, um, to be able to serve uh, and so we look at annual energy. So that's looking at uh, a critical water year um, and then look at, look at all of the forecasted load obligations under that critical water year. Um, and so we measure in that way. And that's one of our scenarios. Then we also um, uh, look at it um, from the perspective of what a P10 heavy load hour is. So looking at that 10th percentile um, in the heavy load hours. Uh, and then another is our P10 super peak. 
Um, so we look at it from that perspective as well. And that's the six peak load hours per weekday by month, um, also given the variability of our hydro system. And then the fourth is the um, 18 hour capacity. So it looks at those um, extreme weather events and the six peak load hours over those three days, um, uh, looking, assuming median uh, water conditions. Um, so those are the four metrics that we already look at those scenarios and RAP would be um, another one. At this point, we don't anticipate that RAP would be the binding. Um, we would expect some of these other measures would probably be more binding than RAP. Um, but that RAP will be, the RAP standard would be another uh, metric that we would start looking at in our resource program. So that is all I have. Um, and um, probably turn it over to Snohomish and happy to answer questions as, uh, as we finish up. Thank you. And um, as, as uh, we do transition over to Snohomish County, it just, uh, we're going to try uh, uh, very hard to stick to the um, agenda and that way we leave plenty of time for the uh, questions and open forum portion. So let's go ahead and uh, pass it over to Snohomish County. Perfect. Uh, well, I'm hoping that you're seeing what I'm sharing here. Can you let me yes. know if that's the case? We can see it. Hey, perfect. All right. Well, my name is Garrison Moore. I'm the Senior Manager of Power Supply for Snohomish PUD. Uh, we are BPA's largest customer. Uh, we are not a balancing authority, so we're pretty unique. Uh, and you know, we're uh, right north of King County over here on the west side. And that's just a little bit about us. You know, if you wanted to learn all the gory details of uh, what we've been working on lately, I'd encourage you to follow this link here uh, to see our uh, resource plans. And if you had to remember three things about what I'm about to share, I would propose that these would be the ones. Uh, you know, the first one is, you know, all of our communities have different portfolios, different, different obligations, different risks. And you know, it's important that the totality of the planning metrics that communities use to meet those risks and set their community up for success are, are irrelevant to them. So you know, I mentioned we're unique, we're not a balancing authority. Uh, we have an all renewable portfolio, which means that we have some really idiosyncratic uh, seasonal energy and capacity challenges. And we're in a maritime climate here in the Puget Sound, which means that we have different types of load profiles in the winter and the summer uh, than others do. Uh, and so we need to be really mindful of that when we think about what do we need to acquire in the future to serve our customers' needs. The second would be, uh, and it's related, right? The, the Western Resource Adequacy Program that Sarah and Ryan did such a great job describing today. Yeah, that's something we're really excited about. We are a participant there. Sarah showed a, a bunch of committees that are out there. We're on a bunch of those committees and, and we're, we're pretty, pretty excited, but that doesn't mean that that's all that we would need to do at Snohomish to make sure that we're taking care of our customers. So we have some unique uh, energy risk mitigation that we need to be thinking about as well as capacity risk mitigation. Uh, James spoke to a little bit of what this might look like in the winter as well. And, uh, and so that's just something that we have to keep in mind. And the last one is uh, deliberately provocative, which is there's so much changing around us, right? Uh, resource retirements, differences in market liquidity uh, and, and how that's looking out there. James had an awesome graph on that. Uh, policy and new technologies, you know, these are all going to be challenges and opportunities that are relevant to resource adequacy too. So the uh, world is changing quick, but that's not a surprise to anybody on this call, I'm sure. So those are the takeaways. Here's some details from us. Uh, these are the planning standards that we use for our 2021 IRP. And, you know, just keep in mind, right, this is before the resource adequacy uh, program was really in full flight. So you're not going to see that here. But just like Rachel mentioned, you know, it's easy to imagine that is maybe a, a fifth 
uh, category here that, that might, might be in here in the future. And our planning standards are dramatically similar uh, to what the uh, planning standards at Bonneville just shared were. And that's you know, a combination of kind of energy, capacity, and for us also regulatory uh, planning standards are, are really you know, part of what drives portfolio ads as well. I'm not gonna get too far into the details here because I wanna show you what this looks like and how it shows up for us. Uh, but just keep in mind, right? We have kind of a layered approach and then we solve for the resource additions that take care of all of our communities expressed risks. And this is a little bit about what those risks look like and, and why we have the planning standards we do. So this takes a look on a forecast basis uh, 2022 to 2025, not because it's special, just because it's a, a, you know, a good time catchment here and says, before we do anything, what's the potential for uh, deficits that our portfolio could not serve and how long would those last? And so, you know, we get a sense that these one hour deficits, you know, they're not too frequent, but if we have a deficit, uh, you know, most of the time, right, that is lasting more than one hour. And so we need to have metrics that take into account the duration of uh, what a portfolio miss could look like so that we're limiting our risk out there uh, as we move forward. So, you know, quite a bit of those you can see here are longer than eight hours. And that helps inform, right, some of what we would need to do in terms of planning and, and uh, a miss like that probably looks a lot more like an energy need, right, than a capacity need. And we can kind of move to the next step here, which would be, well, what are those needs? What's the timing? What's the scale? And what's the, the primary causation there? And, uh, you know, this is really high level, but just to give a sense, right? Uh, in blue, we can see some really pronounced seasonality to what our monthly heavy load hour, or you know, that's an energy, a sub energy metric there on a monthly basis looks like and what we would need to serve that. This is before we add any new resources, right? And so we can see that grows over time. It's not so bad here in 2022 and we're doing things, right? Uh, but it grows and we need to make sure that we're managing that. And then that target week, in orange there, that's the need that would be left over after the blue is served. And you can imagine, right, as you're optimizing a portfolio dynamically, that you can have some overlap between some of these measures, right? If you, you might have a, a resource that serves quite a bit of blue and quite a bit of orange all at the same time, and that's all taken into effect. Um, these causations are maybe more interesting to, to me than they are to you guys, but you know, said broadly, we have some resource retirements and then we have a considerable amount of uncertainty as to what our next uh, BPA contract could look like. But you know, we know generally uh, there may be some constraints there and you know, that, that contract historically has grown, but it can only grow to a, to a certain point. So moving on from there, you can see what our resource strategy looks like as a result, right? So we know that we have energy needs and capacity needs into the future. Um, and uh, you know, we, we haven't talked a whole lot today about this and, and hats off to everybody who stuck around this far into a resource adequacy conversation, but you know, transmission is an awful big part of resource adequacy uh, as well. As we look at our resource options, these are deliberately close to home resource options that you know, can optimize our existing transmission portfolio and resource portfolio and help balance us out a little bit. But you know, we're out there uh, looking for bridge contracts to help us until we can develop enough storage resources close to home to add some of the capacity, some of that orange target week that we talked about before. We are huge investors in conservation, which is taking care of that blue kind of HLH energy shape that I showed you before. We are developing AMI or advanced meter infrastructure in our service territory, which is going to give us the ability to 
grow demand response programs. And we have a, a little bit of solar addition that we think will help us with climate change as that affects some of our hydrology uh, in the future and also contributes to some of our regulatory compliance obligations. So that's how we roll up our risks, look about uh, what we can do and also reflect our community's values to continue to have clean resources in our portfolio uh, serving into the future. But that's not all, uh, you know, we're also looking all the way into the distribution level. So we, you know, of course, IRPs think about you know, the system level, the resource portfolio, but we are doing more and more work that says, hey, if we're investing close to home, uh, we are potentially making outsized investments in demand side, you know, reductions. How is that also going to help our grid, our local distribution grid? Can we optimize where those investments occur so that we may be able to provide more relief in distribution constrained areas and overall provide more value to our customers. So that's early work, but because of our overall strategy, our overall risks and who we are as a company, we wanna see if we can kind of unleash the, the biggest overall benefit to have resource adequacy and then also you know, kind of sustainable structural reliability benefits as well. And this has all been good news. Uh, you know, we can do it. We've got the plan sort of stuff. Uh, but just like James shared, you know, it is tricky out there. Uh, James shared an awesome, you know, kind of natural gas uh, to power forward market graph. You know, I think we're seeing a really similar shape here. This is a different side of maybe the same coin, which is, you know, we're seeing increased price separation from mid sea forwards to real time. So that's right, the difference in, in time of transaction there. And, you know, this is not the same as when I showed you the graph that had some applied uh, causation there explaining it. This is more a deliberately provocative, you know, you, you fill in the blanks with your own, uh, you know, but potential uh, causation here, but. Some of the things, right, there's a lot of uncertainty out there now. There are increasing uh, layers of regulation that are changing the way that uh, forward transactions are made. It's not just our resource adequacy here in the Northwest that's affecting this. California's is changing. And as California's resource adequacy, you know, standards change and, and, and folks react to that, that is changing liquidity here. Uh, and demand here in the Pacific Northwest. And this is just a 2022, right? And we can imagine, at least at least I can, that you know, as you forecast forward, and, and James showed this too, right? You could see more of this. And, and what this looks like is a reflection of the resources available in our region, the competition for them, the uncertainty in our kind of changing world here, and then just the layers. Uh, of regulation that folks need to think about and weave as, as they make those forward transactions. And I'll just share personally, you know, uh, working on implementing the plan that I just shared to you, you know, we're thinking now in forward transactions, how's this gonna affect I-937? How's it gonna affect CETA? How's this gonna affect the uh, no coal multiple month transaction standard in CETA? How's this gonna affect CCA? How's this gonna work with the RAP program? And that's all right for a single forward transaction. So all of these things stack together and the, the cumulative result is, you know, a market that's finding its footing right now on a forward basis. And, and we see that in prices and we see that in the price separation between forwards in real time. So that's a lot, uh, but I really appreciate the time and the, the chance to talk with all the smart, smart folks on this call. Um, thank you. And uh, in the interest of time, uh, Glenn, maybe we'll hand it over to the next portion of the agenda and roll some of the questions into that, if, uh, if that works for you. Uh, yeah, that'd be fine. And um, so I, I would encourage, um, well, basically, any, any of our panelists, um, 
but especially the you know the utility people who were, were just up to um, engage during this next uh, session. <clears throat> um, and and you know I suspect that there'll be quite a bit of overlap with questions people may have about that uh, your presentations and also the uh, the things we're pulling out of the suggestion box. So I'm going to put my screen back up. Um, to show you what I have. Um, and what I've done is uh, I've highlighted a few things that uh, you know seem to come up in the in the chat. And um, what I wanted to do, uh, the, my plan is to start with uh, uh, the interest in different generating resources. And then I'm going to go to uh, under planning methods number six. And then uh, the third one we'll talk about will be under public policy number four. And then we'll just see um, where we get to. Uh, I personally would love to talk about demand response. So I, I may, uh, you know, try to make sure we have time for that one too. And uh, Jay Kimball had um, uh, put some things he was interested in in the chat uh, under the diff under the category of generating resources. It included uh, small modular reactors. I think, but I think he's got some other interests too. So, Jay, would you like to introduce yourself and and um, ask your question or make your pitch, depending on you know what what you want to do. Sure, thank you, Glenn. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right, thanks. I work with Orcus Power and Light Cooperative and we're part of PNGC. Um, yeah, my questions that I've posed on, uh, you know, on the chat, let me just try to sum it up by saying that uh, we really appreciate Washington's 2021 energy strategy, which expects low to double by 2050 while decreasing fossil fuel energy resources as quickly as possible. And CETA is rapidly reducing um, coal generation and so forth in the near term. Um, and I, you know, I feel like this bodes real well for the long-term future of the region. Uh, we've got to do it. Um, this doubling of load will likely initially present, you know, significant problems uh, due to the combination of uh, NIMBYism, if you look at things like Sierra Club is opposing uh, over 300 wind power projects around the country. Um, a lot of we, you know, we see a lot of NIMBYism and wind projects and solar projects around the country. Um, just in our region and in, in San Juan County, we're unsure how people will feel about seeing wind turbines uh, offshore or tidal power generation in our area. Um, and so we're concerned that the massive amount of solar and wind that needs to be developed, which requires a lot of land and permitting and transmission corridors and so forth to be developed may take longer than we expect and therefore um, pose some serious resource adequacy challenges and especially in the coming decade. So I, I'd love to hear the panel's thoughts on uh, how to develop those these new resources? How do we balance things like solar and wind, which are fairly land intensive, with things like SMR, which perhaps are less land intensive, but have their own uh, challenges? And um, I think I've seen estimates from um, E3 that call for millions of acres of land for uh, wind and solar. And just taking a look at all the wind that we have currently and how long it took to develop that and how, how the region feels about generating, for example, wind and solar east of the Cascades primarily for power markets west of the Cascades. Um, you know, a lot of complex stuff and I'd just love to hear the panel's wisdom on, on how that's all gonna unfold and how we balance intermittent versus firm resources and that sort of thing. Yeah, that's great. Um, if, um... If we've got somebody who wants to uh, to jump in on that, you know, maybe turn your video on or or something. Uh, 
I'd love to hear from somebody. How about how about Garrison? Garrison, do you, would you like to uh, speak to how your utility is thinking about those trade-offs? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think I heard a, a couple questions there, right? Which is, you know, there's a big scale of resources that need to be built, right? To mitigate what I, I think everybody's expressed is you know, more steel in the ground, for lack of a better word, to address some of the resource adequacy. So how, how do you get that built and what's the outlook there? And then how do you, how do you balance, you know, kind of the, the firm and, uh, you know, maybe the more variable resources? And, you know, I guess from our perspective in Snohomish, we are sticking to you know those things that we think are, are more practical for our area uh so you know we saw a lot of demand side resources uh conservation demand response those were all things that we've uh, been successful doing in the past demand response is new for us but it's maybe a new flavor of uh of uh conservation in, in some ways we have an emphasis on storage which gives us a lot of flexibility as to what that could look like and what's a good fit for our community. Um, that's how we're looking at it. And we're thinking about storage in particular as a way to optimize the renewable resources that are already here. If you think you know, of our region at a broad level, we're already net exporters of clean and renewable energy. So part of what that means when we're thinking about storage resources is, you know, optimizing what's here with the transmission portfolio that our region already has. And maybe part of that is a reaction to the difficulty in siding new renewable resources, particularly in Snohomish County, where we may not have the best sun or the best wind for that sort of thing. Was that long-winded enough, Glenn? That's, uh, <laughs> that's uh, my modus operandi there. No, I, I liked it. Um... Any other thoughts on that? You know, what, I, one thing I, I might throw in to uh, flavor the question a bit more is whether uh, we've heard a few times th through the day about transmission capacity uh, and how it could really uh, make achieving any given level of resource adequacy uh, easier, both in terms of, the, you know, some of those... Uh, land area constraints, but uh, also just the total number of uh, gigawatts of generating capacity or demand response we might need. Is that something that the utilities are, um, um, you know, seeing as well as transmission as an important factor in resource adequacy? James Gall. I thought I'd, I'd jump in here since I brought it up. Um, you know, transmission is going to be a major issue, I would say, the next decade because we will not have transmission to bring new resources online to help with resource adequacy. Um, you know, what we're seeing today is the uh, transmission system, at least for us, is limited um, with very few new potential resource options. Once we acquire those options, if and when we do, without new building, we can't bring in more. So one thing I heard uh, the mention of storage, and that's one mechanism to help mitigate the need for new transmission by locating you know, storage on the other end of that transmission uh, line that kind of, you can that way overbuild your renewable generation compared to your interconnect. So that could be a way to help with that. But uh, we need to make significant uh, progress with new transmission to the areas that maybe traditionally don't have a, a load there or a past resource to be able to bring those resources on. Now, there are alternatives to transmission I didn't get into, um, especially if you start looking at liquid fuels as a possible solution to deal with uh, you know, peak reliability needs. So maybe we don't build new transmission. We we turn energy into a liquid fuel and then transport that through a pipeline or, 
or a truck to a, a power plant that's closer to load. So there are other options, but uh, I still think you're going to need some transmission, but also look at other options. Great, thanks. Uh, Nicholas Garcia, I think uh, you've got your hand up. What would you like to offer? Well, I, I just want to double down on the transmission issue. And just so people know, Glenn and I are both on the transmission quarters work group that the state has put together. And, you know, one of the challenges we're finding is that there's a tremendous amount of vested interest in various aspects across the state. And, you know, it, it, at least from my perspective, it's very easy to say, you know, my vested interest is really important. The other guys is less important. So if there's a problem or you have to make a sacrifice, you need to sacrifice the other guy's interest. Um, and, and this just kind of highlights the challenge of, of citing new transmission. And, but it's gonna be incredibly important uh, just to give you guys this uh, sense. If you look at the greater Puget Sound area, uh, by 2030, the, the population is anticipated to grow by about 20%. We have about 5,000 megawatts of generation, uh, of thermal generation west of the Cascades. And if that goes away or is severely constrained because of CETA and CCA, um, I don't know how, and, and our load grows because of electrification of transportation and electrification of buildings. I honestly just don't know how we maintain a reliable system even if we double down on the conservation and demand response, you're still going to be able, you need to, to bring power to, to load. And if the, therm, if the um, renewable resources that are available during uh, the winter time, which is the Pacific Northwest's major need, um, aren't producing during that period of time, you know, it's just gonna be very, very difficult to maintain a, a, a reliable system. And that's why we recommended a, a thorough review of the region. Uh, this is under the planning methods and data uh, number six, uh, a thorough review of, of the region, but not just the entire region, because I think that that kind of dilutes the problem. We, we want individual areas to be looked at to see, can those individual areas maintain grid reliability? And that would include West of Cascades areas to make sure that we don't, um, create a problem that while the state itself may have sufficient amount of power, the individual pockets may not because of transmission constraints. Thank you. And I appreciate that uh, smooth segue over there to uh, planning uh, item number six, which uh, James Adcock, you had uh, highlighted that one uh, as one of your areas of interest. Would you like to talk about that? Well, uh, obviously, I would like uh, the ability to um, have independent modeling, um, uh, independent of, of the other modeling efforts, if nothing else, as a, as a, uh, as a, as a, as a check against the other modeling efforts. Um, and, um, you know, uh, Commerce and UTC could, uh, in theory, I guess, contract with an independent uh, organization to do that. Uh, uh, I'll use E3 as an ex as a stakeholder example of a, of a, of what a, such an organization could be. Um, I would obviously prefer that utilities not pick that um, because of the appearance of bias. Um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. All right. Thanks, um, Sashwat Roy. Hey everyone. Uh... This is Sasha Troy with Renewable Northwest. Um, so I, I, I kind of want to focus on, uh, I think the third highlighted here and encourage energy storage resources and um, just looking at long duration energy storage technologies. Um, a lot of presentations today uh, looked at uh, the duration uh, that would be required uh, in terms of loss of load and I think Elaine's presentation went into uh, went into that aspect in terms of how many hours of uh, resources would we would re would we require to meet those lost float events uh, in the future. And I think uh, commerce, UTC, uh, utilities need to focus on long duration energy storage technologies. We've been hearing a lot about hydrogen as a resource to 
you know, meet that long duration or even seasonal storage. But there are other technologies uh, like iron air, iron flow batteries, which can meet those, you know, greater than four hour duration requirements pretty effectively. They are still being worked through in terms of technical specifications, but uh, California Energy Commission recently uh, did a staff report on long duration energy technologies. So I think that could be a good kind of aspect to study, uh, have a stakeholder forum or you know, look at that specifically in light of resource advocacy. So I'd like to kind of put that out there uh, in terms of considerations for you know, meeting these resource advocacy challenges. Uh, I think long duration energy storage technologies, you know, in addition to hybrids, you know, other technologies would be an important aspect in this, uh, in meeting those challenges. Uh, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, John Fazio, would you be willing to uh, respond to that and describe how the analysis at the Power Council um, is incorporating different storage technologies and, and um, and I remember hearing up in the methodology panel some discussion of how um, storage and hydro maybe provide similar type values and in our hydro heavy system uh, storage might not be as uh, impactful as it would be in another part of the country. Sure. Um, I think I think that statement you just made is true because of uh, the amount of storage in our hydro system. Um, batteries, uh, if they have to compete with that, uh, don't look quite as good uh, economically, but that doesn't mean that that there's no value in in uh, exploring that, especially since, uh, I mean, we're looking, we're taking a regional look. And of course, um, uh, there are areas within the region uh, where batteries might be much more cost effective. In terms of our analysis, we have uh, an entire resource uh, team within our staff that looks at, uh, um, that is looking at storage, uh, all kinds of storage, pump storage, uh, battery storage, different kinds of battery storage. And we're trying to, uh, obviously we evaluate uh, all that new technology uh, in on as fair a playing field as we can relative to other resources. Uh, again, we have found in our early analysis that um, it isn't quite as cost effective as in other areas because of the, uh, the big storage in the hydroelectric system, even though it is heavily constrained uh, by non-power constraints uh, and, and other needs of the river system, um, it is still looking like quite a valuable um, tool to maintain resource adequacy. And if I may add, in particular on the demand side uh, uh, of this, you know, a storage with solar uh, residential, uh, looks to be very promising. And we, and we are, I'm not directly involved in those analyses, but we are looking into that stuff. All right, thanks. Um, Sashwat, is, is your hand up? Yeah, I can I respond real okay, quick? Okay, go ahead. Sure, uh, so I, I'm not even talking about storage from just a capacity. Uh, standpoint, storage resources can be used, you know, to defer transmission investments as well, you know, uh, deploying them closer to load. So in that aspect, you know, if, if a storage resource can reduce transmission congestion, that can, that's a value to RA in, uh, in the future as well. So just not as a capacity product, but looking at the multiple value streams of storage resources. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Um, Steve Taylor from Cowlitz PUD, you suggested that we talk about uh, unspecified source contracts. And this comes in under the public policy category. It seems like we ought to talk about at least some public policy during this workshop. Yeah, I, I think that was the main point of the, <laughs> of the workshop is to uh, take a look at how the clean energy policies uh, might be impacting um, uh, grid liability and, and resource adequacy. Um, this is kind of a, a smaller issue. Uh, it also uh, ties in with uh, market liquidity. Uh, but um, uh, so Cowlitz PD, um, we will uh, buy uh, physical products on a forward basis, uh, looking at our uh, you know peak load periods, and that's you know typically in the in the winter time. 
Um, and uh, we want to make sure that if we uh, have to call on that power, it, you know, it is there uh, versus using, let's say, you know, hedging with a financial instrument. Um, but when we buy those products, um, you know, they're on specified products um, and uh, they're usually on a quarterly basis or times that we've uh, done a, an annual product uh, as well. Uh, but uh, under the definition of uh, coal, fire, coal fired resource um, in, uh, in CETA, um, you have uh, your unspecified market purchases. Uh, the contract length can only be up to 31 days. Uh, if it's greater than 31 days, then, then you have to basically assume uh, that uh, there, you could have a liability with a, a coal resource there. Um, so if you do bring that to load and uh, you attest uh, that uh, the, uh, you have no coal in your, in your system and come to find out through maybe some form of audit that, yep, there was uh, a coal uh, in, in a product. You didn't know it at the time, but uh, uh, at the end of it, uh, there is, you know, there's coal there, then, then you can be subject uh, to significant penalty. And so uh, we're just concerned about how, what impact this might have on uh, individual utilities, uh, resource adequacy efforts. And, um, uh, and, you know, whether we want to consider um, uh, seeing some type of change that allows some flexibility, uh, either directly in the statute uh, itself, um, or, or within the, the rules that just, you know, allows enough flexibility so that the attestation can be made, as long as you're attesting to the fact that there's, uh, you did not know that there, you know, may or may not have been coal in that unspecified purchase at the time, uh, which is, you know, part of the point of that product. Um, so, um, uh, you know, from the standpoint of, hey, we're trying to eliminate coal, uh, CETA has specifically the no coal standard. Um, uh, you know, how do we reconcile that? I think a reasonable policy uh, position uh, is, is based on the fact that coal continues to be retired uh, from, from the overall uh, Western Interconnect. Uh, we'll see uh, diminishing coal over time. And, uh, and so why would a utility not just rely on unspecified purchases then uh, if they could get around the no coal aspect? Uh, the point is with the uh, cap and trade uh, program in place, um, you, know, you are going to have an emissions liability that would have to be uh, covered through purchase of allowances. So I think utilities have an incentive to uh, you know, actually bring unspecified products to load uh, as, as little as possible. Uh, because, so as to uh, reduce that that liability. So sorry to meander here, but this is a little it's a it's a smaller uh, pro, um, smaller issue to deal with, but uh, one that I think uh, would be good to consider. All right, thanks. Would uh, would Ryan or Sarah from uh, the Western Power Pool would one of you be willing to talk about maybe a couple things actually? One would be uh, how a a contract for unspecified power would, might get assigned a value in the resource adequacy program. Uh, I know when I first uh, heard about this concern, I, I was kind of puzzled by it because it, it seems like if you don't know the source, it could be hard to, uh, you know, have a good sense of whether it's going to be there, uh, you know. When you need it um, at some point, you know during the peak period. But then the other thing you might uh, have some some background for us would be uh, about the storage resources and how uh, how those will get evaluated as a source of capacity uh, in the in the resource adequacy program. Uh, Glenn, I, I can take the. Um... Uh, specified versus unspecified source. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Perfect. So when we think about this in the program, it's very important for us that these contracts that folks have are backed by firm physical resources. And when we say that, that can mean one of two things. The, the first thing is, is that it is from a specified source. Uh, the generating unit is sort of named. We know, know what um, you know, resource that comes from. But we also allow system sales. So for somebody like Bonneville Power Administration, you know, um, BC Hydro acting through um, PowerX, those folks have a significant fleet of defined resources and can make system sales um, from those resources. Because our program requires an accounting of the entire generating portfolio, we allow something like a system sale, which could be an aggregation of the resources 
that we have an accounting for. And so from our perspective, that meets the requirements of the program because we have the, on one side of the ledger, the set of generating resources, on the other side of the ledger, uh, the set of contracts that have been sold against those resources. So we can ensure in aggregate that they are not oversold. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about sort of, you know, financially firm products, something like a WSPP Schedule C. So prior to the inception of the RAP program, folks have these longstanding sort of agreements. And there's two things that are going to happen. One, we're asking our participants to work with the suppliers of those contracts, um, and they can attest to the fact that it's backed by a firm physical resource, that it is you know, sort of a more than financially firm, a series of attestations. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to count that um, towards our uh, program. So we're going to give them the option to sort of go to the supplier, have the supplier attest that it is backed up, that it's saying not something that's going to be backfilled on, uh, you know, in the, in the spot market. And then we would accept that. Other than that, those contracts um, will not be accepted in the program. So hopefully that addresses the uh, specified versus unspecified. And, and I think that that terminology is a little bit different than what you might see um, in CETA where, you know, or, a system sale may have a component of that sale that does have a carbon emitting resource in it. You know, we would look at that and say, this is for a fleet of resources. Some may be carbon emitting, but it is firm physical uh, supply. So we sort of have both sides of the ledger and can track those um, uh, things. So hopefully okay. that answers that question. Yeah, thanks. Well, uh, the other part was uh, the, the idea of, um, storage and long duration storage and how it might get scored in the, the resource adequacy program? So uh, of course, when we talk about storage, we talk about kind of two different things come to mind. Um, the first is because we have 40%, you know, of our resource stack is hydro. Uh, we do think about storage in that sense, which has come up a few times um, on the chat. You know, that is being accredited and um, I'll sort of loosely described based on its performance on the capacity, of criti capacity critical hours. So that 10 year data set that we have identifying you know, the potential hours of greatest need with the exception that we allow the projects to exercise the utilization of the water and storage that they had. And so you know, we see that sort of as an improvement uh, on uh, historical performance. We allow those projects to say, exercise storage up to their maximum generating capability if there was fuel there subject to the set of non-power constraints. And so um, that's the, the accreditation for storage hydro. And then we get to ESRs. So a couple things about this. We've really thought about ESRs kind of the duration um, as it relates to this capacity critical hour analysis. Um, Garrison showed his um, kind of pie chart, you know, showing it's one plus hours, two to four hours, six plus, eight plus. We've done a similar thing. Roughly 70% of these capacity critical hours are, are kind of five hours in the winter or less, four hours in the summer or less. So that's kind of generally how we think about accreditation of, of storage. What is its ditch, discharge capability over that period? With the addition of the desert Southwest, we are going to move to, and this was touched on by E3, an ELCC methodology for um, uh, valuing um, energy storage. And so I think, um, you know, we see significant penetration in the desert Southwest. We know that's going to grow over time and then Pacific Northwest as well. So we're going to transition that sort of deterministic methodology to something that is like um, ELCC. Obviously there's all the complications about when do you charge, when do you discharge, when do you discharge relative to economics. We think we have some room to sort of um, uh, get more sophisticated there, but th that's sort of how that transition looks. Deterministic, we're moving to a probabilistic view, and then we'll learn over time how much more detailed modeling we need to do. Um, you know, NREL other folks are looking at sort of sophisticated storage modeling. Hopefully that covers it, Glenn. Yeah, thank you. I can see there's a lot of work been done, but there's also a lot to do still. So I appreciate the, the uh, where you are on it today. Are there other um, things out of the suggestion box that uh, that people would like to to bring up? We've got a few more minutes. James Adcock. Yeah, uh, 
Occasionally in this conversation, we've heard uh, the concepts of building too much uh, renewables, too much wind and solar. And I, I just want to, we always think about, that, about this, these things as being must, must run, but on a utility scale, wind and solar is, are not really must run resources. They are, are variable dispatch, uh, variable down dispatch. If the, the wind and the solar is there, you're not required to use it. If you can't get that power to market, either because of transmission constraints or because of load, you just don't do that generation. And as we get more and greater wind and solar penetration, I would expect that we're going to run into more time when that's the case. And that effectively makes the additional wind and solar more expensive. But it also makes them more reliable because it means that a greater portion of the time when you actually need them, there's the capacity there for you to call on. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Nicholas. So um, I'm going to go back to one of the early uh, uh, presentations by the Northwest Power Conservation Council. and. Um, I don't remember whom, but someone even before them, and they were talking about the importance of imports and the and the fact that if the Northwest region didn't have imports, the number of hours that we would be short and the amount we would be short were significant. And the question is this: during uh, a lot of the discussions about the Genesis model, some people, not me, but um, I'm curious of what the reaction is. Uh, some people brought up the concern that as California starts employing batteries to a much greater extent, their willingness to send power north um, is going to go down because they're going to want to keep it for their own uh, use. Um, and that may undermine the assumption that 1500 megawatts is available at call uh, to bring north from California to meet uh, immediate needs. And I'm just curious if there's, if, if, if um, John or anyone else might have a reaction to that concern, whether you think it's a real concern, is it something to be investigated, or is it just kind of not something that you see as being realistic? So uh, just, just looking for some feedback. That's, yeah, that'd be good. Uh, and I, I would, even add to that question, um, you know, do we have to pick an arbitrary number and uh, say that that's the import capability? Or is this something that uh, with, you know, more data and modeling, we could uh, actually, you know, know what's reliably available and what the diversity benefits would be from uh, getting to it? And, and eventually even what what's the value of transmission uh you know how much how much would we save in terms of our resource requirements uh if we had better connections to other areas of the west ryan you came on so i think that means you've got all the answers no i i don't have <laughs> all the answers i just i wanted to offer some perspective from the from sort of the western power pool well, please do um, so this is an area, this sort of making assumptions about import capability that we, um, you know, have a, some concerns about. Um, when we when we hear the question, if you could just tell us what the excess capacity above operational uh, needs is, you know, there, there's a whole lot embedded in whether that is actually available or not. There's planned outages. There's all kinds of uses for that capacity. Um, that, that may not involve import capability into your region. And so one of the things that we have said is it's very important to, for us to understand on a forward basis, the firm supply that has actually been contracted for. You know, from our perspective, we want to know what firm supply has actually been contracted for. We feel like that is the thing that we can count on. You know, when we think about sort of information sharing with CAISO, you know, we think it's very important for them to understand what supply has actually been contracted for to go to California such that it can be you know, reliably counted on, right? We see kind of just an assumption about uh, import capability uh, being very problematic. And it's something that 
you know, given the size of the footprint that we have, that understanding of what has actually been contracted for on the forward basis that is not relying on supply that may not be there, um, you know, in that uh, sort of spot market, um, uh, real time market is critical for us. That in our studies, we're making sure to include the things that have been contracted for and really making no assumptions about, you know, what may be available that's not contracted for in other footprints, because there's just no guarantee that you know, if there were excess here that it could be exported, if there was import somewhere else that it could be exported. What we can really count on is that firm contracted for, you know, firm already contracted for supply. So, so Ryan, I'm curious how you would react to this. It, I'm no expert in this area, so I wanna be clear enough. I have misunderstand the facts, I apologize, but my understanding that CAISO has taken it upon itself to have the power to essentially supersede a contract if it was needed to serve interior KISO load from a resource that was passing through KISO. Um, and that might interfere with even the assumption that a contracted resource was available for someone outside of KISO's use, including the Pacific Northwest. Is that a, is that real? Am I, do I, do I understand what KISO has done? And is this something to be a, concern for our reliability. So I guess, Nicholas, I would be, I don't want to speak on behalf of the CAISO. So I, I, you know, tangentially or generally understand the issue with the wheel throughs. I think when we take a look at that contracted for firm supply, you know, we would be making a consideration for exactly how firm that is. So, so the answer is yes, you know, I don't want to sort of speak to their policy. But when we have that sort of bucket of supply that is coming from outside the footprint, sort of we as a program will evaluate that and say, you know, is it in fact firm? What may impact the ability for us to rely on that beyond the fact that it is just contracted for? So, so that's something like that is front of mind. Thank you. Nora or Austin, did do you have questions at this point or no? Okay. I think um, one question that's come up a little bit, Glenn, is um, under planning methods and data, the first question about incorporating climate change in integrated mm -hmm. plans, um, both utility integrated resource plans, as well as um, resource adequacy planning. I'm wondering if folks on this call have suggestions of data that should be used, um, whether it's, you know, there's often a debate versus of using past data versus more speculative data about what future climate change patterns could look like. So wondering if anyone has any suggested data sets that this group should be aware of. Garrison, go ahead. Always happy to grab that open mic. Um, <laughs> you know, gosh, I'll, I'll just share that, you know, we've worked with UW Climate Impact Group. Uh, you know, they, they issue reports um, and, and we've also contracted for consultants to extrapolate data uh, that they have available on the kind of West Cascades hydrology looks like. And we also, uh, look to the, the great work that BPA um, in the RMJOC have done uh, to think about what climate change could look like for Bonneville and you know, that, that broader regional hydrology. We do incorporate that on a forward basis. And the thing that's really tricky, right, is uh, you can get swamped in data really quick, right, with all the, uh, the, the different uh, GCMs out there, global circulation models, and the way that that downscales into, uh, you know, specific uh, geospatial vectors and all of those things. So for us, we take the long view, we take a lot of composites, and we look to the totality of the data to look at the distance between where we are now and where we're headed. And we try and use the totality of that data to have kind of a balanced view of trends and we incorporate that explicitly in our expectations of ambient temperatures on the load side and uh, of the impacts on hydrology on the supply side. And it's easy to get into the specifics uh, of data and wind up with tail events that may not represent something 
uh, you know, that's within the realm of expectation in the near term, just because of how noisy those data sets can be at a granular level. So hoping that was long-winded and nerdy enough, uh, but, but that's what we do at Snohomish. John uh, Fazio, were, were you suddenly yes. indicating your availability? I was. I, I don't, I didn't see how to raise my hand on, on here, but. Well, we but got I you now. Yeah, but but I turned my uh, my mute off. So I was just going to say that um, um, you know the there's always this uh, this trade off uh, using well. First of all, there's some uh, the RMJOC did do a great great job in downscaling the data, and there are 19 different scenarios. We didn't use all of them. We chose three representative scenarios for our analyses in the power plan. Uh, we do think that it's the council thinks that it is. Um, a better indicator of future conditions to use projected climate change data, but I recognize that there's still some skepticism about, about how that data was downscaled and whether it is uh, too extreme or not extreme enough. Uh, and so Bonneville, for example, has chosen to use um, the last 30 years of the historic record, which now is a 90 year water record and goes up through uh, temperatures up through about 20 uh, just a couple of years ago and so um, I think uh, I think using and some have suggested using a blend of some historic data plus some climate change data although I don't know of anyone who's actually done that in practice uh, but I think that if if there is some skepticism or concern about using climate change data and we don't use all of it we only use one one decade at a time for example if we look at years in the 2020s we only use the climate change data for that decade uh, but if people um, are concerned then my recommendation would be um, sure use historical data but use the most current record you can but use a sufficiently long record so that you can capture uh, enough of the annual variation like maybe the last 30 years would probably be sufficient which is what what bonneville has chosen to do so um, even though we and, and we're going to continue to look at uh, at climate change projections i'm sure that they'll get better in the future but if uh, but that would be one uh, alternative if people didn't want to use climate change data or if it's not available for them uh, to use historical data, but to use a more current or a uh, shorter record, but more current rather than a long term, uh, longer record. Thanks. Right. Well, thank you. Well, I think we might be ready to uh, wrap it up for today. Um, I'll. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, let Commissioner Rundahl and... Oh. Oh. Sorry, sorry, Glenn, I, I wanted to, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I did have one more uh, comment I wanted to make about batteries and storage, and I wasn't quite sure when to bring it in. Oh, well, uh, go but, ahead. Be but before you wrap it up, uh, we did mention uh, today uh, a little bit about resiliency, and there are efforts underway to try to assess the any added value that energy efficiency measures might have in order uh, in the sense that they improve the resiliency, let's say, of residential of residences or uh, commercial or, or uh, industrial buildings in the sense that, uh, for an example, uh, weatherization might allow customers to withstand longer periods of outages. And so um, in the sense of, as an alternative, um, you know, batteries do offer, uh, uh, you know, like uh, batteries in homes or batteries with solar in homes uh, might add, uh, they do have some value in terms of adding to the resiliency of the system. And so, and, and of course, obviously there's an added advantage of, of um, uh, the transmission where you, you don't need transmission if you can build a battery uh, uh, where it's mostly needed. So I just wanted to throw that in as an added value for uh, storage um, in the region. That makes sense. Okay, um, in a second, I'm gonna ask uh, Chair Danner and Commissioner Rindall if they have any last observations or questions. But first, I'm going to, um, oh, and well, Senator Sheldon, go ahead. Thank you very, very much, Glenn. Can you hear me? Yep. You're coming Great. Uh, thank you very much for uh, moderating and all the participants. I'm, I'm very proud of the bill I sponsored two years ago to get this process started. I think it's going to be very helpful 
thinking of just uh, current events and everything that's going on in the world. And I also want to thank uh, Representative Mossbrucker, who's been on the line as well. And uh, she's had uh, similar bills and we're going to uh, obviously watch the results and uh, just thank everyone for participating. It has been very educational for, for myself, who is not a part of the uh, uh, electrical engineering community to say so. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Senator. Um, one thing we thought was that um, because the discussion today may have sparked some uh, some ideas or thoughts, that we would leave our uh, our suggestion box or you know the the survey um, open for uh, a short while after the meeting. Uh, Austin Scharf. What do I mean by a short while? Do I mean like through the end of the month or next week or? Let's do the end of the month. Okay, to June 30th. We're gonna uh, continue to um, receive um, suggestions that people might have uh, about Things that uh, the utilities or the policymakers should be doing, or the planners, to uh, you know, do a better job of assuring our resource adequacy as we meet our important energy and climate goals for the state. Um, so, and we'll uh, we'll include that in the next uh, notice that we send out about our work. Um, and then I'll uh, I'll close for myself and for Department of Commerce by thanking all of you for participating, uh, and thanks to the staff who helped um, plan and prepare and uh, collect our speakers and all that sort of thing. It was a lot of work, and I think it really uh, uh, we got a lot of information packed into the day, and I I appreciate that. And I certainly appreciate uh, the willingness of our speakers to, to contribute in the way they did. It's a complex, important, and fascinating subject. And uh, I've learned a lot from it today. Commissioner, our chair, Commissioner Rendall, go ahead. Good afternoon, and thank you um, to Glenn and the staff at Commerce and uh, Nora and Jason and staff at the commission for putting this um, workshop together. And I think what I have, what has been reinforced for me during this session today is how interconnected we are. It's not just Washington, but it's uh, the region um, and the West and how interconnected we are and how the various resources across the West interplay with one another that affects how we value and how we count resource adequacy and that how we count resource adequacy is also, there are different ways of doing it. I appreciated the really technical um, presentations, which I hope to go back and look at more about the different ways and counting resource adequacy in a variety of ways to make sure you get the full value. So, and the promise of, of the resource adequacy program from the Western Power Pool and how that might help everyone in the region um, make sure that we keep the lights on for the customers in the most cost-effective way. So I appreciate everyone's efforts, everyone's presentations today, and uh, look forward to hearing uh, any additional suggestions um, to the two agencies as we, as we wrap up this effort this year. Thank you. Chair Danner? Well, I don't have much to add to that. I think that was a very good summary from Commissioner Rendell. I too wanna to thank uh, uh, Nora and Jason and Joel and the team at the UTC, as well as your team at Commerce, Glenn. Uh, I think this has been a very informative day. Um, I'm very impressed by the very sophisticated work that is going on in the region um, from, from everyone. And I, I thank everyone for their participation today. Um, and I think we have learned, or we are learning a lot. Um, I think that the survey responses actually uh, are very useful to help guide some further inquiries. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, and I just uh, think that we have to keep uh, our 
our eyes on the ball here and, and uh, uh, resource adequacy continues to be a very important uh, goal for us. And, uh, and we just gonna keep on keeping on. So thank you. This is a, a very useful conversation today. All right, well, thanks everybody. Austin, any, uh, any closeout instructions? No, just to thank everyone uh, for their participation today and that we will post the recording the next day or so on our resource adequacy page. The survey materials are there, the presentations are there. Um, so we appreciate your participation and uh, look forward to um, first publishing our uh, summary of, of the meeting and then uh, reconvening the meeting next year. So thank you all so much. All right. Thanks a lot, everybody.